This is Jocko Podcast number 387 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. Combatives, the art of hand-to-hand combat, bridges the gap between physical training and tactics. The products of a good physical training plan, strength, endurance, and flexibility must be directed toward the mission, and soldiers must be prepared to use different levels of force in an environment where the intensity of a conflict changes quickly. Many military operations, such as peacekeeping missions or non-combatant evacuation, may restrict the use of lethal force. Combatives training prepares the soldier to use the appropriate amount of force for any situation. Combatives training includes arduous physical training that is mentally demanding and carries over to other military pursuits. This training produces soldiers who understand controlled aggression and remain focused while under duress, possess the skills requisite to the mission at all levels in the spectrum of force, have the attributes that make up the warrior ethos. Personal courage, self-confidence, self-discipline, and esprit de corps. And that right there is a quote from the U.S. Army's Technical Circular, TC3 Tech 25.150 Combatives. And the Army has made huge advancements in the past several decades in their combatives capability and ability. They incorporated elements of grappling and striking and weapons into a comprehensive system that has become a solid foundation for soldiers that are in any military occupation. But as the manual states, combatives doesn't only help soldiers with hand-to-hand combat. It helps with improving all their attributes as soldiers and as human beings. And it's an honor to have one of those soldiers with us here tonight who has led at all levels as an officer who not only trains in combatives, but helped establish the combatives program in the Army his name is General Michael Farader. He's a retired Army general. He served in Somalia, he served in Iraq. He's a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And he's here to share his experiences and lessons learned with us. General, thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. Good to see you. I always have a good time diving into the history of combatives in the Army and the Marine Corps. Even the SEAL teams has a little history of combatives. We have an old, I have an old uh, field manual from years and years ago, and it's pretty neat to see. And there's been some some vast improvements in combatives over the years. I'm sure we'll get into that. But uh, I always like to start at the beginning. Let's start, let's talk about where you came from and what made you, you. Well, I came, uh, grew up in an army family. My dad uh, joined the army during World War II, at the beginning of World War II, he was a private. He went to officer candidate school and uh, served in the Pacific. He was put in for a Medal of Honor. He received the Distinguished Service Cross. Uh, and as he raised my brothers and sisters, he always told us, you gotta take care of the men. You gotta take care of your troops. And then things will work out for you. And so, he also being an officer candidate, <clears throat> we had to roll our socks and put them in the drawer, and <laughs> smiles facing up and answer the phone. You know, Colonel Farrader's quarters, Mikey speaking, this line is unsecure, you know, back in the, in the 60s. So so how long did your dad stay in for? 27 years. He retired as a colonel. Yeah. And were you just old school moving all the time growing up? Yeah. We we moved. Uh, I'm, I lived in 18 houses by the time I was 18 years old and then raised a family uh, and probably moved them just as many times. And uh, th- this we just came out a month of the military child and... Um, there's a lot of truth to the resiliency and uh, flexibility and adaptability of military kids Mm -hmm. and uh, their ability to start over. You know, my mom used to throw us out in the yard and say, go explore, find out who lives in this neighborhood, see where the other kids are. So your dad was put in for the Medal of Honor Mm -hmm. and ends up getting uh, the Distinguished Service Cross. Mm -hmm. What, What did you, growing up, what did that mean to you? What did you know about what happened 
you know, did you did you do you have the citation hanging on the wall? Did you hear the story from him from his buddies or what was that like? That's pretty yeah. amazing. Yeah, that you know that generation. You know, my dad had I think a silver star, a couple bronze stars, a couple purple hearts, and they were in the garage on the wall. <laughs> they didn't have an I, I love me room like like uh, my generation, right? So, um, but I went back to Guadalcanal with him when I came out of Ranger Company Command in 1989. And we walked his battlefields and we went and dug out canoes with like, with islanders and we walked up on you know we saw where chesty puller and then marines went and red beach and then inland and then all the way up to uh, almost to new caledonia it was amazing so your dad did like the full pacific campaign he did yep <laughs> i mean talk about casting a shadow <laughs> you must have always felt I mean, to this day, I mean, how do you ever feel like, uh, you know, when your dad's that guy? That's amazing. Well, you don't want to disappoint him. You, you could take a whooping, but, but if you get the D word, you know, I'm disappointed. Then that, 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 that just kills you. So he was a great athlete. Um, he played uh, before the NBA. He played professional basketball and he played up to AAA baseball. He came out of World War Two, went back to play baseball and you'd lost a lot of steps and a lot of speed and uh, so he went back in the army mm -hmm. and uh, and then continued on and then did he go to korea as well uh he did not fight in korea he, he went uh like probably in 53 or 54 mm -hmm. uh, 58 about 58 yeah. i was always interested in that part of dick winter's book where dick winters you know fought world war ii the entire european campaign they recall him for for Korea, mm -hmm. he gets to I think it was San Francisco. They're about to get on the boat, and they, they said, "Hey, anyone that was that fought in World War II, you don't have to go." And he goes, "Cool, I'm out." He he yeah. he had enough combat. You he know. was done. Mm -hmm. And he said, "I'm go back to my farm in Pennsylvania." Amazing. And um, so so you're growing up, you're going to different schools all the time. What what schools were? Oh, sorry, what sports were you playing? I played baseball and basketball. Were you any good? I was pretty good. Or were you disappointing your dad the whole time? <laughs> no, no, my, I, I did not. But, uh, you know, going back to that military uh, child, di different different kids, you know, could could get after better than others. My older brother didn't like it, and he didn't play sports, and and, and he, you know, he would get the D word more than than, <laughs> than me. But uh, um, we moved to Germany. So, and we lived in Heidelberg and then Berlin. So, you know, um, a lot of my deeper thoughts about where American strength and power and, and the investment in our, our young men and women, you know, when, when we had a footprint in Berlin, the Russians did not, you know. And so now in the Middle East, when we get sent over there, there's, there's some validity to when we're there, then the Persians are not. Mm -hmm. And so um, pretty, you know, there were a couple incidents when, Everyone mounted up on the Berlin Wall, you know, machine guns and tanks up. And uh, so that kind of gives you, as a 12, 13, 14-year-old, um, a good taste of, there's a real world out here. And so, you you, you know, if you're going to do something, do something that makes a difference and be ready when it's time. So how old were you when you decided you were probably going to go into the Army? It was pretty funny because here I'm in San Diego and, and uh, we retired. My dad retired and we went up to Lake Tahoe for a couple of years and then so my high school and then my last year was down in Monterey in, uh, at the, in Pebble Beach at the school. And so I, I applied to West Point and did not get in and applied to uh, ROTC. And back then, if you got an ROTC scholarship, every school that has ROTC writes you. So I, I, I felt like, you know, Tom Brady, everyone wanted me. <laughs> and so I said to my dad, hey, dad, uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. I can play baseball down there. There's all kinds of, you know, good-looking girls down there. And he said, hey, I want you to take a look at this school in Charleston, South Carolina. I said, Charleston? Yeah, it's a military school. I said, Dad, I got shoulder-length hair, man, I'm playing baseball. He said, you need to take a look at this. And so I, I said, nah, I'm, I'm going to go to UCSB. And he said, take a look at it again. And so didn't want to disappoint him, right? And so... And I said, you know, I loved it. In fact, when I was in Berlin um, back then in Vietnam, if you were a great athlete, you you were playing on the commanding general's football, full pad football, above the rim basketball, and, and fast pitch baseball. 
And so I would talk to these 18, 19, 20-year-old guys and say, shit, really? You don't ever put a uniform on except for sports? And I said, Dad, I want to join the Army. I want to do that. So that was kind of in the back of my head, knowing that that really wouldn't be that way. Though a lot of people who've known me for the 35 years that I served think that that's probably what I did anyways. <laughs> a lot of time in the gym and a lot of time uh, on the playing fields. But uh, so I said, okay, I'll, I'll go to this military school for one year if I, you know, if it works out fine. So what year, what year did, was it that you graduated high school? 75. 75. So you had long hair and your dad was okay with that? He was not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what kind of music were you listening to? Just like the typical 70s rock? Yeah, probably Beach Boys and the Eagles and, and uh, uh, Doobie Brothers. Uh huh. <laughs> and, and he convinces you to give one year shot at the Citadel? Yeah. Did you have any, when you went there, you know, a lot of times young men are impressed by the whole the uniforms and the discipline and they get a little bit excited about that thing. Did you have any of that or were you just doing it to, to gratify the old man? You know, I, th there's a lot of physical uh, challenge there too. So I, I enjoyed, you know, you know, the running and the obstacle courses and, and uh, working out and then th some elite, you know, drill teams or other kind of teams trying out for those things. Um, but what what's funny is, um, Two years later, my brother goes to University of California, Santa Barbara. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> with a little brother. So, but uh, um, the president of the Citadel was a guy named Signius, Lieutenant General, retired, and he had been the commanding general in Berlin. So they they had me booked, you know, six years earlier that I was going to end up going to that school. Dang. Yeah, and it, it it worked out pretty good. So you show up there, they shave your head, the whole nine yards. Yeah, at the end of the first day, I'm rubbing a. Shaved head thing, and dad one, Mike zero. <laughs> let's see, let's see where this goes from here. <laughs> Were you, uh, you know, I was talking to people about the shock of boot camp, and it's. Did you get that little shock of saying, "What, what the hell am I doing here?" Not really. You were down. You were ready. Yeah. And then, then you you go. What are you studying when you're in at the Citadel? I studied business, but and uh, you know, m mostly the management, leadership, management side of it, it interested me. The accounting. I didn't like that. Not so much. And what about sports? Were you playing any sports? Ended up um, trying out for the baseball team and got a call back. And that was the first day we were allowed to go downtown Charleston. <laughs> so, so they were, you know, the young women were like five for every cadet. And so I. So how'd this work out for the baseball career? Yeah. <laughs> it became a huge intramural player. So that they had sports all, you know, all year round. So I got to, you know, still get the bug and. And you had a good experience overall at the Citadel, though? Yeah, real good. Then uh, what year did you get commissioned? 79. And did you, so when you're getting commissioned in 1979, what well, this is Jimmy Carter's president, mm -hmm. The what, what's, what's the outlook on the military as you're going in? It's low funding, probably recruiting trouble, or I guess recruiting that might not have been too bad because the economy was bad. Um, Post-Vietnam, um, all the good NCOs and good officers, m many, many, had left service. They, they, they've they seen what combat is, they, like you said, about uh, winners. And uh, lot, so in the first couple years, most of the NCOs that I had were uh, uh, alcoholics. And so all volunteer force just started. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, and the um, I ended up at a, at a mechanized, infantry in Fort Riley, Kansas. And the Army back then had tiered readiness. And so, if, if, you know, 96 days, get on a train, go to Germany. But if you're in the 82nd, so you were level four, so you're unfunded. Um, we had a rifle company with three platoons authorized, but only men for two platoons. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was pretty bad until President Reagan came in and, and really, uh, you know, resourced us a couple big things happened in those mm -hmm. first six years. When you when you got commissioned, you go straight to uh, did you go to the infantry officers basic course. Is that what is I that did. what the pipeline was? It was yeah. And how long was that school? Uh, Fourteen weeks. Are you feeling like you got a good education in that? I mean, I had uh, I had James Webb on here, mm -hmm. who was in the Marine Corps Navy Cross yep. recipient, and he was went to the basic school, went to the 
Marine Corps Infantry School, Infantry mm-hmm. Leader School. Got on a had twelve days of leave. Got on a plane. Went to Vietnam. Went out. The, they walked him out into the middle of the field. Pointed up a ridge line and said, there, "There's your platoon." He walked up there. He said, "Who am I relieving?" A sergeant said, "I've been the platoon commander for the last whatever it was." Our other platoon commander got ex- wounded or killed. You're in charge. And that night they got in a big gunfight, and he was calling in air support. And I said, "Were you ready for that?" And he he said, "Yes." So. They at that time, you know, in the middle of the Vietnam War, they the Marine Corps was squared away at getting those guys ready. You know, I've often looked at some of the training that I went through in the nineties and thankfully we didn't get thrown into war because we wouldn't have been ready for it. Mm-hmm. How did you feel that that course prepared you? Then I think we would all say it prepared us to do a squad leader's job. <laughs> not command a platoon in combat. Yeah. And uh, and that was gonna be taught um, when you got to your first unit. And if you had a squared away captain, you know, 03, then it was taught. And if you didn't, um, your sergeants would probably bring you along if, if you're smart enough as an officer to listen. Then that's what happened to me. My, my captain was, was horrible. You, you show up, your captain's horrible, so now it's on the NCOs that are gonna get you trained up? We just kinda said, hey, we're in this one together. Let's, you know. Let's get me get me trained. I'll, <clears throat> I'll bring leadership and energy. You know, but what does bad leadership look for look like for a captain? Just for informational, educational purposes. When you say your captain was a bad leader, what was up with him? Uh, so I, I always tell everyone, Jocko, that you know you enter the service with your faith and your friends and your family and your integrity, and you should leave the service when someone tries to take that from you. And so my first captain. Um, was a liar and a cheater, and uh, um, he would steal things. And uh, he he gave me the he said, "Hey, take this truck to Topeka and trade everything that's in the back of the truck to the guy, and he's going to give you some stuff and put it in a truck and bring it back on Sunday." I said, "I'm not going." And he said, "Your career's going to end right here." I said, "I'm ready for that. I'm ready for that. You know, it, there's nothing you can do. There's nowhere I'm going to end up." That doing this for you is gonna, you know, make it right. So he said, "Get out, get out of here." He called in another lieutenant. And that guy took the truck, and it was a truck full of stolen goods or something. Yeah, yeah, you know, from, um, he would he would end up getting excess. He he trade internally mm. to get stuff, and then you know, he stole a trailer. It, it was parked in the field, and he sent his you know, supply guy, "Hey." Go hook that up to our supply truck, bring it back. Because he could trade that for someone who needed a trailer who had lost one. He's just a scumbag. <laughs> okay. So your first, <laughs> yeah. You just, yeah, yeah. what makes you decide you're going to stay in? I guess I guess you had the family tradition, so there was no yeah, getting I'm, out. Well, you know, my mom uh, was a really strong, uh, elegant woman from Boston. And, uh, and she would say, hey, if you don't like something, then, you know, get to the top and change it. And, you know, either, and, and then my father would probably add to that, if you walk out, who do you think is going to take care of those soldiers? So, you know, he, w- he would have supported me leaving um, at the end of the first four years. My high school best friend at about year 16 said, you've served 16 years for four years of college? You're a fool. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, John, I stayed in because I like it. Uh, so, so that's your first job um, out there in, in Fort Riley, Kansas. Sounds like you're learning some lessons of at least how not to act. Yeah. Uh, where do you go from there? Well, as you said, I, I went from the basic course to Fort Riley. They didn't allow my class to go to ranger school. So here I am, a lieutenant with no ranger tab, and every you know payday breakfast, some general says, if you're an infantry guy and you don't got a ranger tab, then you're you're not worth it. So I lived four years, and... You know, the sort of uh, a theme is wanted to go to West Point, didn't get in, went to second string, the Citadel, which none of my classmates would agree with that. <laughs> but, but it, you know, when you're 18, you're like, oh, my gosh, you know, damn it. And then you go to the basic course. You know, your dad is a, a paratrooper and, and uh, a distinguished soldier. It's like, okay, I'll get my ranger tab and then get ready to go to combat. No, no ranger tab. <laughs> so, so I came back to... Uh, 
1983, went to, and I'd been offered a bunch of company commands as a lieutenant. You know, stay here, it's a captain's job, but you, you got what it takes. And I had to tell the battalion commander, I gotta move on, it's a big army. You know, I got, I got some things I gotta fulfill. So I went back <clears throat> and about eight captains and again, the same number, 200 lieutenants and, and young sergeants started ranger school after the captain's career course and only one graduate. And because uh, it's too easy for them to, to say, hey, I've already, I've been out there. I've already led, I got good reports, you know, I can get, I can get what I need. Were you a captain yet when you went through ranger school then? I was, yeah. So you went through ranger school as a captain. What year was that, like 1983 now we're talking, 1984, something yeah, like that? Uh, October 83 to uh, to January, or December. Like, Did you prepare for ranger school? Like nowadays, people when they're going to some kind of selection, they, they go through a pretty, they, if they're smart, they'll go through a pretty hardcore training regiment to get ready. Did you prepare train and prepare for Ranger School? I did, and and uh, I'd be, you know, Columbus, Georgia, you know, August and July, August, June, carrying an eighty pound rucksack, sweating like, you know, and I, I was a, probably a whopping, you know, one thirty eight pounder, you know, one forty two, you know, and uh, but other guys are on the golf course and they're laughing and joking and you know. And holding the beer up, and they see me and my big black dog walking, and then laying half, you know, I'd, I'd shoot an azimuth. I'd say, you know, hey Kelly, go out there, go 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 go, sit, and then I'd, I'd walk to him, and then send him again, sit, and all, all that. But uh, and then night land navigation, you know, all, all the things, not tying, all, all the things that were going to come up. You know, you spend the time, you know. And you, so you were ready for it. What were the numbers that you just threw out there? You had how many people start this? Let's say probably 228. And 228. And these were s captains? That you're eight, only eight were captains. So only oh, eight captains it. had the courage to uh, try it again or try it uh -huh. because they already were comfortable. You know, yeah. complacency is a killer. Yeah, it is. And, uh, <laughs> and so in this case, uh, we started and, uh, and only, I, only I graduated. Uh, a guy named Danny Green was recycled. He later graduated, and all the others quit along the way. And then of the 220 uh, young officers, lieutenants and young sergeants, probably about 48 made it. So we probably had a graduation around 50, mm -hmm. starting 228. What was, what was the hardest part or the biggest challenge for you in ranger school? Um, I mean, if you were 138 pounds, I'm surprised you even lived through that. <laughs> Once well, they cut your know, food every, off, <laughs> everyone was 138 at the end, so I, I didn't. Have, you know, I lost probably about four pounds, and I, I saw big men lose, you know, lots. Uh, part of it was, you know, I'd, I'd been deployed with the unit from Fort Riley around the country and overseas, and and I had done a lot of training. Um, we ran a basic in AIT, Advanced Individual Training. The Army had an idea, send them to the unit and you train them up. So when I was going to Ranger School, I kept thinking, they gotta have a safety net around here. We're, we're going down this river, it's going pretty fast. So, you know, they gotta have a first aid tent around here, you know, for hypothermia. So I was all, I had already been a support platoon leader and a battalion, you know, logistics officer. So I was just kind of, and, and my, my Ranger buddy was Ed Ruiz. He was a staff sergeant from the 82nd Airborne and he thought he was gonna die. He's like, <laughs> we're, we're gonna die <laughs> all this stuff you know and to me i thought it was like you know disney world if you're taller than mickey you can get on this ride here and so man i'm gonna get five extra jumps this is great and 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 i literally would you know he would eat everything they gave him they give you two meals uh for a day or three meals for two days and i ended up just my ruck was getting heavy with the, the sea rations so my ruck was getting heavy with extra chow and then and, and, you know when he'd start whimpering i'd go here you go take this here's here's spaghetti here's you know all that um so you know everyone has a day or two that are bad days in ranger school and uh, and if you have your ranger buddies then they carry you through and likewise you do it for them so I'm, you know to me it's, it was a leadership uh you know uh opportunity and just put one foot in front of the other. What was the most uh, significant leadership lesson you took away from Ranger School? Um, it, you know, I think you, if you're not building teams, they're falling apart. That's a life lesson. And so you're, you're constantly trying to make the team stronger. You're going around uh, and, and 
probably learned it because I thought that's probably the right way to do it. And uh, and then when you you see it come together and you see that uh, we can get through this together, kind of thing, then you know. And I you know I served with a lot of those enlisted guys, all went to the Ranger battalions. So then when I started serving in the Rangers, there's all my Ranger buddies who are now NCOs that know Captain Farragher's, you know, he's legit. You, when you get done with that, what's your next duty station? Uh, I went up to Alaska and uh, and took it in Fairbanks, north of the Arctic Circle. Ended up taking command of the Parachute Infantry Company, Charlie Airborne. And we, we had 50 guys at a reunion. So from 1985, 50 guys still get together in uh, Fairbanks, Alaska, and and the Arctic, the Uke they call it, it. It makes men, you know. They they all come in with skinny little legs and buck teeth and big ears and no neck, and after they carry their rucksack through the through the winter on snowshoes, they're tight. They're tight group and hair studs. They so. end up with a thick neck, big legs, and smaller ears. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's all moving in the right directions. So now you're you're a company commander. You said at that point. I am. And what was your you know how, how what was your premise you know from a leadership perspective when you took company command? How how did you? What was your what was your first sit down with the troops? What did you tell them? What was your kind of your principles of leadership? Somewhere along that time. Um, I coined the idea, you know, or the motto, you know, we win together. And so it's pretty simple, but it's we, and it's together, and it's about outcomes. And they all wore a maroon beret, you know, fancy hat, and uh, and they thought they were invincible. And, and I told them, you guys, you know, we don't live fire. No one in the Army does, but I don't really care about that. I care about us. So first it was, you know, applied marksmanship, basic marksmanship, then applied marksmanship. And I would challenge the NCOs, and the reason I think we're still together is, okay, let's let's figure it out. There, there are great shots in this world, and everyone in this company needs to do that. And we will walk everywhere. So we'll parachute in, and we'll walk to the front gate. There's no buses coming to the drop zone. All right, we're, we're going to be hard. You know, not not full of ourselves, but, you know. And so then I, we challenged uh, my best friend's company to a wrestling match. And uh, so he got the NCO club, is all kitted up. And, and when the first paratrooper got pinned by a non-airborne guy, they couldn't believe it. It was like, wait a minute, we're supermen, we're airborne. It's like, okay, so now the hype mm-hmm. and the reality, let's work on this here. So we got to maneuver live fire level. And uh, um, and they're, they're just great. So the, the whole thing is, I think in life, if, if you um, treat everyone like they're really wicked smart, and you know, there were guys at the Citadel that would walk around like you know dumb privates, and then you'd see them on a basketball floor, and they were natural leaders. And those kind of observations taught me: you have no idea the fierceness in, in a platoon or a company, and you have no idea the talent that's around you unless you let it come out. And so that was that's the way I, that I do it. I've done it my whole life. So <clears throat> then. Uh, I get, I get a call from the uh, Department of the Army. Hey, you've been up there for three and a half years. We, we got something for you. And I said, what do you mean? They said, we, we, got, we got a recruiting job down in San Jose. It's real close to your home. Or recruiting or uh, reserve duty. And I said, <laughs> the phone lines up here in Alaska <laughs> are not that good. And I hung up. So I called down the 2nd Ranger Battalion. And I uh, talked to a friend of mine named Bernie Champo. I didn't know him at the time, but he became a, a long friend. And I said, hey, I'm, I'm coming out of company command, and I'd like to come compete, try to try out for the Rangers. You're supposed to be the best of the best. And he said, man, you should have called a year ago. You know, we're, we're, we're booked way out. And uh, I said, look, I'm, I'll, I'll fly down there. I'll give it a try, whatever you want. And he said, I, I can't help you. And then a guy quit. And so he had my name right there. So, you know, what is it? Wayne Gretzky says you miss every, you miss every shot you never take. Mm-hmm. And so he calls up and says, hey, Mike, this is Bernie. Um, if you can be down here. And it's like, I'm standing next to him. <laughs> here I am. So um, so that worked out really so did well. You, did you have to go through some kind of selection to be an officer in, in the Ranger Regiment? Yeah. Yeah. We, we called it rope back then, Ranger 
uh, orientation program. Now, is now they use RASP. Yeah, now they use RASP. Okay. The selection program. And how long was this selection program? Uh, probably three weeks. And you were ready for that thing, even though you hadn't been preparing. You've been preparing just by being an infantry company commander up in Alaska, humping a rock and doing mm-hmm. what you're doing, mm-hmm. yeah, and, yeah. and wrestling against the the legs. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. <laughs> And, and again, I'm the basketball player and the uh, and the baseball player, not not a grappler yet. You know? So that that's what's really unique about. It. So yeah, so it, it you know combat water survival test, which is you know simple. And I grew up water skiing and playing around, and, and then uh, shoot, and then um, twelve mile foot march, five mile run in uh, thirty five minutes, and. Um, so you, the idea was one, it, it was an orientation program because they wanted you to know how to tie your gear down, where it goes, how, what see all the weapons that you're going to see when you get there. And then, and then uh, but also to know that if, if you take that, you, if the, the day you arrive, they go on a 20 mile foot march, you can do it. Mm-hmm. And first, it's just an investment and good, good, you know, people management. You don't want to waste time bringing someone in and then have them to flop out because they're just not fit. So, you get assigned. Then you 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 get assigned to the range regiment. I do. As far as I can tell, and I, you know, I I was in the Navy obviously, and I worked with the Marines a lot. I, I worked with the Army on deployment. I worked with the Marines on deployment, but. And you know, I work with special oper- or special forces. I work with uh, Marsoc. I've worked with kind of a bunch of different units. I've worked with Rangers before. I was lived next to Rangers, but I, but the from what I could tell on the outside, looking in, it seems like Ranger Regiment is kind of the the most uh, Spartan of the units out there in terms of the day to day life. Of being a ranger, and I've also been told this by by friends that were in in rangers it, at ranger battalion. The life that you lead there is like you're a ranger. That's it, nothing else. And what we're going to do is be in the field, and we're going to train. And there's a lot of young kids there. It's a very young mm-hmm. group, you know, because mm-hmm. you can go right out of high school to training. You can, you don't have to go to ranger school to go to ranger battalion. Right. You can just go through that two or three week thing, and boom, you're now at a ranger, in a ranger battalion. What was, t- tell me a little bit about the day-to-day life of being in a ranger battalion. Yeah, it was, it's, it, so the day-to-day life started on Sunday where you got a high and tight haircut every Sunday. And so, you know, you either had a flat top or you had, uh, it looks like a, a divot from a golf course landed on, <laughs> on top of your head. And it, so, and then, so everybody starts right there. Everybody carried a ranger coin. If you didn't have your coin, you get smoked, you know, uh, or you buy beer for somebody. So and getting smoked is you're actually like doing push-ups and PT like you're in boot camp. Yeah. So that kind of thing doesn't happen in it doesn't happen in the SEAL teams. That's for sure. Like no one's going to make you do push-ups when you're in the SEAL teams. Though you you might if you do something really stupid, you might get slapped around. You might get actual duty assignments Mm -hmm. but you're not you're not walking around this there's no there's no feeling of boot camp whatsoever when you're at a seal team yeah yeah ranger regiment is not like that you you, there definitely is a boot camp you know you yeah you don't want you know so i end up commanding a company being a battalion s3 being the regimental s3 commanding a ranger battalion so you've seen it at every level yeah and except for the regimental commander and, Jack. You know, and, but but there's there's a rites of passage. You know, um, every officer who serves in the Ranger Regiment has already done the job. So I commanded the parachute company. I come back and command a Ranger company. I commanded a parachute battalion in the 82nd. Came back and commanded. Oh, got it. Had been That's a, smart. Battalion S3 in the 9th Infantry Division, and then Battalion S3 for Third Range Battalion. In the enlist in the platoon, there there are echelons i i joke about you know you you just love it when a new private comes in because he gets the, the green scrub pad and you get the buffer <laughs> right and so you're no longer sticking your hand in the toilet cleaning it right but uh the, that until the the ranger gets to ranger school he he's he's a lesser now he, they'll fight you know in a bar together they'll take care of them uh they'll fight in combat together 
but there's there's you know i have gone to ranger school i'm a corporal e4 or i'm a sergeant e5 and you have not and uh, you're a specialist that came from korea and we're the same e4 you're not the same Mm -hmm. so that so it starts there in terms of the spartan life um the uh you know the officer is supposed to eat last you know make sure the troops the rangers got their chow that kind of thing um but everyone has to meet that standard and so uh if if a guy falls out of a run falls out of a foot march then um the army gave uh summary release authority to the range battalion and so you get dropped and then you send down to legland or send down to 9th infantry division or 24th infantry division back in those days and so you you had to stay on it and uh, and you had to learn to play hurt and so you you're jumping and walking through the night and falling in things and you know if you got hurt and you the wounded will the beast kind of syndrome you know the lions see the one that's limping and you know they'll go after the ncos or someone will go after someone that's um can't keep up and so so it, it, it's a good it's a good tough life yeah the so you get you get a haircut on sunday you get a high and tight on Sunday night, what do you, Monday morning, aren't you going in the field all the time? Don't they spend a ton of time in the field? In, yeah, in a, they'll go. So first, first of all, there's no other than uh, combat prep. There's no picking up trash. That's what the divisions, you know, on the same post. So we'll do a rotation of st- stocking the shelves in the commissary, um, being the gate guards, and all that. Rangers don't don't do that. And uh, so instead, it's probably in a rifle company, probably Tuesday morning out, uh, Thursday evening back, or through the week, two weeks, but a Thursday back, the weapons cleaning, then that late into that night, weapons cleaning the next day, um, hang your boots to dry somewhere, and then uh, get a haircut. <laughs> yeah, and most guys don't spend more than one tour at Ranger Battalion. Is that accurate or no, inaccurate? Yeah, the, 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 uh, I was at, where was I? I think I was at either Bragg or Benning, and there was a guy who looked like he was made of, you know, leather and freaking muscle. He looked like he might have been 45 or 50 years old. He's in the, he's in the commissary. And he's wearing like his ranger panties and like a ranger t- t-shirt and i'm like this guy is 100 percent <laughs> ranger you know he's and and i've always i've always uh heard that most guys they do like maybe it maybe four years hitch there maybe they'll do one more but then they move on because the, the lifestyle is just so spartan the the, the senior nc senior ncos will stay and and uh a lot of guys will go from private to platoon sergeant, the same platoon, you know, 15 Dang, years. That's awesome. Yeah. And, uh, and then, and then some, some leave. Um, if someone messes up, then, uh, like I said, they'll, they'll get, uh, dropped from roles, um, a release for standards, RFS. Uh, and they, you can tell them, hey, you can come back, you know, six months, you can come back to this unit and never do. Once they get to the soft life, they're not coming back. <laughs> they're not. So, but but uh, it's very close and tight. Is it, you know you've got this this kind of caste system, but it's also it's a brotherhood like none other. Yeah. No. And, so, uh, salute to the Rangers. Every time I work with a Ranger, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get a 100 percent professional soldier that's ready to do the job anytime, anywhere. Yeah. Uh, outstanding. What was from a leadership perspective? What did you take away from the Rangers as a leader? Um, so it probably came out of there with with what I would call my my command philosophy, but which is funny because my son Patty commanded the same Ranger company that I did, and uh, the only time in in history that a father son command the same Ranger company. And he he wrote me and said, many years later, so in two thousand six, he wrote. Hey, Dad, I've written my command philosophy. It's six pages. Would you read it? And I and tell me what you think. I said, no, I won't read it. No one else will either. <laughs> I was going to read six pages. I said, he, he said, well, what's yours? I said, it's easy. I've had it since, since Bravo Company 275. One is do your best. Uh, do what's right. Improve daily. Build teams. 
take care of a little guy or show that you care and never quit. And so I, I kind of came out of there with, if you're not doing that, then um, you're probably falling behind. And uh, as, a, as an older guy, as an older officer or as a general, you know, I would tell everyone, um, do your best means don't try to be the best because the team suffers when you try to advantage yourself. You know, you know this. Mm-hmm. And then do what's right. Be true to your wife and leave everyone else's alone. And they, and they all look at that. And I, and, and I said, this is not a religious thing, man. This is, you're going to ask them to go up that hill. You're going to ask them to you know, leave the airplane in combat. They trust you. And too many senior officers and senior NCOs, you know, they cheat on their wives. They think it's no big deal. And now the, now the truth goes, the guy's fake, you know. If he lies to her, then he can lie to anybody, right? And then the rest is about the build, building of the team. And, and uh, when I was in, in Alaska, this guy, <coughs> finance officer, I pulled him through the cage in the finance building because this private from Charlie Airborne got no pay due. So I, I'd hear him in the first sergeant's office saying, Jones, uh, it's no pay due. Uh, all right, send him over to finance next morning no pay due means he's not going to get any money yeah mm-hmm. okay and so um the next day i hear jones's voice first sergeant i you know platoon sergeant's talking in there so i'm listening well he, he didn't have enough copies when he went over there for finance so they kicked him back so now he's got four copies okay so then the next day i hear his voice he signed the copies in blue ink and at that point i said that's enough <laughs> So I said, first word, I said, sir, I said, no, this, this guy's wife thinks he's an idiot because he's working for free. So I go into finance and the captain there um, was my next door neighbor, his name's Art. I said, hey, Art, my, my private's no pay due. He's been in here, this is the fourth day in a row. And he said, oh, well, gosh, we can fix that. What's the, what was the problem? Well, you didn't have enough copies. Yeah, you gotta have four copies. You got a copy machine right there, Art, number two. He signed it in blue. Yeah, we, we got 100%, you know, no deficiencies noted in our inspection. And at that point, I grabbed one. To, <laughs> to I said, I'm going to kick your butt in front of all of your troops right here. Be, or, or you're going to pay this kid right now. That You know, that that word gets through that the boss is going to stand up for us. And I think uh, that's what we, we're supposed to do. So that's what I really learned in those first two company commands. When you were at Ranger Battalion, are you going on deployment anywhere? Or do you just, were you just staying in Fort Lewis? Yeah, we traveled the world. Okay. Yeah. Um, back then, we had jungle uh, training in Fort Sherman, Panama. So every year you'd go there, um, you'd go up into the Arctic, Fairbanks or, or Fort Richardson or Norway or something like that. And then um, we, we you do a long in-flight rig parachute rig and then parachute into Germany and, and move for three day, three days and nights and then attack bad bad tolls as a was an army airfield there um, went up to Boise Idaho jumped in the desert we, we would go we'd go quite a bit so you just go on big training operations and and get back square your gear away get ready go do it again go to the field and and then then once every uh, eight weeks you take two weeks stand down and then Twice a year, you take two weeks of block leave. The whole unit shuts mm-hmm. and goes. <laughs> Squared away. The Rangers don't play around. Uh, so what'd you get? What'd you do when you got done with uh, with with this tour at the Rangers? Um, I, I, I had to go next door and uh, be in the motorized uh, infantry, and, and then Desert Shield, Desert Storm kicked off, and, uh, and then I went to Commander General Staff College, and then. Um, when I was in Commanding General Staff College in 91, 92, the uh, regimental commander came to interview, and we had t- about 20 Ranger Company, former company commanders in the, in the course. And uh, the word w- out was these guys, this guy, this guy, and this guy were going back to the regiment as majors. And, uh, and so I thought, well, if they've already picked. But I stopped by to see the colonel and um, General Buck Kernan, um, it's the regimental commander. He said, oh, God, I'm glad to see you. I heard you were going to go to the 101st, but I got a spot for you. I said, shit. I said, I'm here, sir. Let's go. Were, when the Gulf War went down, where were you? Were you in uh, the command and general staff college? When, yeah. Mm-hmm. How pissed off were you during yeah, that time? Yeah, me and, and you know, whatever uh-huh. it was, 12, 600, you know, pissed off captain promotables or majors. Yeah. People tried to call back. 
try to go back to the unit. And, uh, you know, back in those days, a war lasted, you know, a weekend. Yeah, that one did last, what, 72 hours or 96 hours or something yeah, like that? Yeah, Grenada was that way. Just Cause was that oh, way. Oh, yeah, Grenada, too. Mm-hmm. Did, did you go to, you, did you go to uh, Grenada? No, I was in Ranger School during uh, Grenada. And, and then, then I, what about Panama? Um, I gave up the Ranger Company, and six months later, Panama. Oh, man. Yeah. So one of the things that I would say uh, to you and for this podcast is there's there's a lot of times that you don't get what you think is supposed to happen in life, you know? And, and like, the Lord is your assignment officer, you know? And, uh, um, and I, you know, I should have been. Is not that's not a good way to look at life. Yeah. You know, it's you know, look through the windshield and not the rearview mirror, and make something of what's in front of you. Is kind of what I would tell people. So didn't get West Point, went got the Citadel. Didn't get Ranger School, got the weapons platoon. Didn't get a rifle platoon. So when I went to Ranger School, I was like a blank disc. Or you know, it's like somebody teach me how to how to maneuver because I I've been shooting mortars. You know, then got up uh, to. Uh, Alaska got the Airborne Company, got Bravo Company in the, in the Rangers, and then didn't get to go. Uh, but in, in each case, you you, you got to you know go with purpose, do your best, do what's right, take care of somebody, and things will start to work out. Yeah, well, in, the, in those days, you, it was just a roll of the dice whether you were going to get to go to war or not. And, and in those days, you might be in a unit where you know you are not going to go. And so you still had to motivate the troops or some of them didn't want to be motivated. Mm. During those days, we invented something called the urinalysis. They didn't have it prior to 83. Mm. And so you you know had drug use and stuff like that. And uh, and suddenly now you, you you know who is and then you could punish them and, or correct them and all that. So the Army changed a lot in, in from 79 to, you know, 94. So after college... And what did you learn there? I mean, where, what were you learning? What was your main main takeaways that you got out of going to the two years of command and general staff college? It, it, it's one year. And, uh, okay, one yeah, year. Yeah, and um, someone told me that, that the next 10 to 15 years of service will be with this group. So knowing that there are people who are not infantry and they're squared away, they're smart, you know, and up until then they've kind of been sequestered into – all male infantry units and 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 one thing i I never left an infantry battalion until i made colonel and that's pretty rare and so i was always finding a way um you know to get back and uh and different kind of infantry maybe and then back to the rangers and then 82nd airborne then back to the rangers so so then that's what happens you get they had a slot for you back at the at the regiment Uh, and yeah first first at regiment and and uh then General Grange or Colonel Grange made me the battalion or the regimental S5, which could be civil military affairs, but actually it was, I want you to create the Ranger Monument at Fort Benning. <laughs> I want you to create the J- uh, James Deets Prince. I want you to create the pavers and all that stuff. And so um, he, he, he went to go worldwide because we'd, We'd been left out of uh, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, except for one Ranger company uh, from First Ranger. Um, Schwarzkopf didn't didn't like the Rangers, mm-hmm. and uh, he had been at Fort uh, Stewart, and so he probably felt that they were prima donnas. And, <laughs> and so for what, whatever reason, the Rangers didn't get a lot of action. And so General Grange's, uh, then Colonel Grange's view was, I'm gonna go to each of the combatant commands and, and then arrange for an exercise. So, will be used and then he came he would come back and he, he asked the communication officer there's these kind of radios delta force has these kind of radios i want you to you know and he'd come back and said what's the word on radios and the guy go oh, i can't i didn't make any progress and then go to this guy you know this kind of supply stuff we need this, this kind of rapid deployable parachute thrown out from a helicopter no action then he came to me and, and i said here's the print you know this this print is that here's the sketch and Met with these guys in Florida and, and that. And, and uh, so in 69 days at the regimental level, I was then sent down to 3rd Battalion where everyone wants to be in a battalion. <laughs> so it's the shortest. I think I was hailed and farewelled at the same <laughs> social event. 
And that, so now you get into the battalion, yeah. and what are you doing, ops there? Yeah, we have an extra field grade in, in the range of battalions who does the special ops liaison and coordination. So for one, and you're really schooling yourself on, on what the other S3, what the S3 is gonna do, and you're probably the heir apparent. Um, so, I, so I was the LNO, and, and uh, after a year, um, I moved into uh, the S3 job, and then my battalion commander and another range of battalion commander were killed in a helicopter crash in the Great Salt Lake on October 29th, 1992. So then um, Danny McKnight uh, came and took over 3rd Ranger Battalion, and, and he, he led 3rd into Mogadishu with Bravo Company, and, uh, and they worked with, with the Jordan Special Operation Task Force there. And he, he was not half the man of, the, of Colonel Keneally, and I think it had, to, had a lot to do with uh, a lot of problems in the street there. And, uh, you know, when you think about the lieutenant colonel, they're, they're still pretty young, but when you're a captain and a major, you expect a lot from them. And if he's a ranger commander, you expect a lot. So I was asked to be the chief of staff for the Army's uh, aide-de-camp. Um, and my wait, wait, so where were you when, when um, did you deploy to Somalia then? I did, but I deployed after the big fight. Got it. So I brought Alpha Company and A Squadron um, forward from, from uh, Delta Force. And we, we had trained. We were going to be the replacement. And then October 3rd had the big fight, and we arrived. October 4th at about 6 at night. And then we did patrols, got Mike Durant back, um, and then um, and then the president, President Clinton, struck a deal with ID, and we thought we just lost six of our buddies. And Gordon Shugart lost, you know, uh, Sergeant Cleveland, who was a pretty good friend. I did a lot of missions with uh, uh, Task Force 160. And he was dragged through the streets, and then you see, you know, it just giving up. So, um, very proud of the Rangers. I think uh, Ranger Scotty Miller, who retired as a four star, was the captain on the ground for the Delta Force, and a great friend and a great, great, great officer person. I think any other unit in the Army that day would have been killed to the man. And uh, my Bravo Company and and elements of uh, right. Task Force Ranger did was amazing, remarkable, and you know, courageous beyond description. What was the when you so you land on four October? Mm -hmm. What was the atmosphere when you get there? Yeah, it's really really eerie, sullen. We got mortared that night, and we one guy killed, and and uh, um, Doctor Marsh, uh, Task Force doctor, wounded badly. Uh, Grizz Martin was killed. He, he had been a second range battalion guy and then did the long walk and joined uh, the guys at Bragg. Um, but it was eerie. Um, they, there was sort of this uh, rationalization that had occurred that, that, you know, the ranger standard didn't have to be followed because we we're hanging out with these cool guys. And I, and, uh, I felt we sent my colonel there uh, ill-equipped to command because he didn't have his staff. And so I, when I think I felt when I got there that uh, I assumed that role of leadership again to get the Ranger Standard back up to speed. And uh, I mean, they hadn't even sandbagged, you know, the, the place they were living in. And uh, they were just kind of playing volleyball and hanging out and then going on missions and stuff. So, um, and then, and then they were, you know, they lost, we lost some, we lost six guys. And uh, it means a lot to uh, all these guys. And to me, yeah, it was uh, obviously just, just horrible. I'm, I'm, you know, I was, I was in the SEAL teams at that time, and we were all just. Well, I didn't have it. We had Durant on on the podcast, and it was so, uh, so surreal to hmm. be sitting across talking to him when, you know, like I said, I was in the SEAL teams, and we're watching, you know, seeing the videos of him and watching him get dragged through the streets and watching the, the videos that got posted or that were on the news. And, you know, you just think this guy, well, you want to do everything you can to help him. I mean, obviously I'm like in, I was in San Diego, you know, I mean, we're, we're not going to get to do anything to help him out. But 
yeah, what a, what a what a tough fight and a tough situation. And um, so, w- when you get done with that, what's your what's your next job after that? When I became the regimental operations officer, we planned Haiti, and I got ready to go into Haiti. And then I think General Powell and a few others went down there and brokered a peace. So we were rigged on the airplane, mm-hmm. clamshell. We are three hours from jumping into combat, clamshell. <laughs> <laughs> and then actually, um, that night, my mom passed away. So she had cancer. And, and uh, so an Air Force uh, tactical air control guy drove me from Savannah to Ford Bedding where I met my my wife and Margaret linked up with Margie and, and then she put me on a plane out to Monterey to uh, settle my the estate so the whole time period was from Keneally Dine Mogadishu Haiti my mom passing and then one month later I take battalion command at Fort Bragg and it probably was kind of numb for about six months mm-hmm. someone told me once said, you know you, you got that smile back you got that sparkle back mm-hmm. i said i didn't know it was gone yeah it, you must have been uh quite focused when you showed up where did you do your first battalion command it was fort bragg and second battalion 504th parachute infantry and uh with the 82nd with the 82nd uh first brigade commander was uh john abizade really great officer and the second one is the, the famous Dave Petraeus. Mm-hmm. So, um, General Petraeus and I would r- race each other. And so the other battalion commanders, when Petra- when when uh, Cur- then Colonel Petraeus would come out in the morning and look around, we'd all be stretching and they'd run and hide behind the bushes or the barracks. And so he would say, uh, "White Devil Six, let's go for a run." I said, "All right, sir." So then. We'd go two out, two miles out, and then come back. And at the beginning of the fourth mile, we'd race. And so, I think he's probably got me by about three. But I say, hey, sir, if you want to play one-on-one basketball first, <laughs> you, you know, you want to wrestle, you you want to you want to do anything else. But uh, so we had a lot of fun when when he would come to Iraq later. Um, I would tell my aide, we're gonna get a call tomorrow night at twenty-three hundred. To meet with General Petraeus at zero four, he's like, "Sir, that, that sure, you know." So we we learned to take a day off before the race the next day because he would try to sneak in there and, and uh, know you probably smoked yourself the day before. And so, so when you're doing the battalion command now um, at the eighty second, are you guys doing a workup cycle where you're training and then you're moving to a higher state of readiness? Is that is that what you do in the Army? I, I'm in the Navy, so we, our cycle was always, and it's the same with the ships, and the Marine Corps falls into this too. They do kind of what the Navy does, which is get ready to go on deployment, and then you board ships and you go on deployment. In the SEAL teams, you get ready to go on deployment. We, sometimes we board ships, sometimes we just fly to another place, and we stay on deployment for six months. That's, mm-hmm, sort, mm-hmm. Of the, that's sort of the methodology of the Navy and methodology of the Marine Corps too. When you're at 82nd and there's no war going on, what do you do? Yeah, you have three cycles. Um, Division Ready Force 1, 2, and 3. If you're in 2, that's the intensive training cycle. Mm -hmm. And if if you're good at it, then before you enter 2, you've you've done your basic marksmanship of all weapons. So now you can go straight into collective training. And then uh, at the conclusion of that, Eight week cycle of really field time, then you, you become ready force one, and all your vehicles are rigged up to be para dropped. All, all your ammo is ready to go. So you're basically on standby at that point. Yeah, and then um, if you're on three, you um, can take your block leave, or you're picking up trash and you know stashing just shells into commissary and stuff. <laughs> you legit do that? Soldiers legit do that? Stock shells in the commissary? Mm-hmm. I did not know that. I don't think anyone in the Navy stock shelves in the in the commissary in the Navy. I don't think so. Yeah, I could be wrong. Yeah, but at least in the SEAL teams, we didn't. I don't know. Uh, yeah, you when know. you try, you, you know, you, when you're a new officer, first time in eighty second, and you try to tell a sergeant major, my guy shouldn't be stocking shelves. That, <laughs> <laughs> that dog doesn't hunt very long in the eighty second. <laughs> What'd you take away from General Abizade and, and Colonel Petraeus at that time? 
Well, um, so attributes were, uh, they're very focused. Um, one intensely focused, General Petraeus, the other uh, focused and very cordial, very friendly. Um, one very good listener, one a pretty good listener. Um, and so I, what I, in seeing this- Who was the very good listener? Who was the pretty good listener? General Abizade was, was a very good listener. He's just curious as heck. Mm -hmm. And General Petraeus was prone to um, thinking if he knew what he wanted, then he didn't need to listen as, you know, mm -hmm. you, you just had to be a little smoother at bringing up, mm -hmm. you know, sort of be helpful and useful if maybe, you know, those kind of discussions. Um, I have great relationship with both of them, mm -hmm. really great, and, but they're, they're little, little different leaders. When, um, as, a, as a battalion commander, what did you take away as, as a leader? Did you make any big mistakes? Did you have any huge lessons learned as a battalion commander? I, I, so the first was understanding really, you know, um, who, who did you need to own their heart? What level did you need to own their heart to know that the unit would do anything for you? So at, at a company level, you, you know all 180 guys or 160 or whatever, you know. And if you get the E4 mafia kind of with you, um, then – you, the companies can do anything okay. and and the uh at the staff sergeant and uh, sergeant e5 right in the middle of that was where the battalion commander so I mean, so how do you get that well you got to run pt with them you know you got to roll with them you know you, you got to um, be on that foot march when when they step off for the expert infantry badge you, you got you know not only do you step off but you you beat everybody on a 12 mile foot march so they know, they know he, he he can do it. You stand up to the brigade commander when they, you know, somebody's ragging on your guys. You go, sir, I, you know, it's not your job. You run a brigade, I'll run a battalion, and uh, I got this. So that you got to earn their trust. Um, so I, I think I learned that when you can do that, then you, you can do anything. Mm -hmm. Then what was the. Uh so the, you just were telling me that the you, you do in Rangers you already did the job somewhere else. So now did you go? Is this when you did battalion commander at Rangers? After that, yeah, I went down to uh, Fort Benning from from Bragg at this at that time and took Third Range Battalion. And this is what 1996, 1997 time frame. Yeah, it's 96 to 98. And this is where you get your introduction to jujitsu. Am I correct? It is, yeah. <laughs> and what was that introduction like? Uh, it happened this way. What you know, what it was like. It was awesome. But it happened this way. Then Colonel McChrystal, Stan McChrystal, um, asked me, "Hey, what do you what do you think about uh, bringing these guys, Hoist Gracie and Horian Gracie, um, in and training your sergeants? Uh, this idea of hand to hand or combatives or." And, and I said, well, what, sir, what's that going to cost me? And he said, it's $40,000 for two weeks. Well, we didn't even have night scopes on all of our machine guns in 1996. I said, sir, I'd rather take the money and put, put it in the scopes, you know. And he said, okay, good, good. Um, you're going to do it. I just want to know how you felt about it. <laughs> so I said, all right. So then within a week or two, um, I walk into the Ranger Dining Facility, and there's these two guys sitting at the table uh, somebody introduces them to me and you know I'm looking at a hoist great this close so I'm thinking I wonder what he'd do if I slapped him right now <laughs> I didn't slap him I was gonna say yeah, yeah. I actually do know what he'd yeah, do yeah, I know. <laughs> but and it, now we all know that but they uh, they introduced um, uh, ground fighting in the form of Gracie Jiu Jitsu and I asked him you know why are you winning and he said you know my you know our, our father um took a Japanese style of fighting and, and put the Brazilian side on it and uh, and we can win and we will win. So I, I, our, our recurring theme is to trust and, and uh, super back up your, your non-commissioned officers. And so we set, set up the training and then we pure fleeted it. And uh, right as I started to understand it, then the Army sent me to Boston. So... Um, went up there, went into Kenny Florian's place once or twice, 
Mm. And uh, um, and I trained with his brother Keith about two months ago. It was mm -hmm. pretty good, pretty pretty awesome time. And, but uh, so third range battalion is where combatives was in, introduced. I went to the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy um, in Tufts University. As you know, I was joking, say that's a senior national defense fellow. So let's show a little respect around here with a title. But then w when I came back, there's another one of those example. Um, there's a lot to talk about third range battalion and learns and live fires and and uh, guys getting killed and and uh, and hurt and training. Uh, is that during live fire evolutions? Uh, guys getting killed at a demo range. We had uh, someone put P for plenty, you know, just trying to, let's get rid of it all. It, mm -hmm. it threw a dirt clod of clay in, in the air that was the size of a piano or something and landed on, on guys that were behind the burn. Oof. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, you, you learn when you're doing these things that it's dangerous. And if you do what's right, go back to that one, you're going to be okay. If you're with the right people, you're going to be okay. But when you do something wrong, what did the investigation on that look like? I mean, what was the, if, you, if you're talking to a young soldier right now, a young ranger right now, what, what would they take away from that? There was negligence and, and uh, you know, the master breacher uh, was found, was court-martialed and departed the army. And what was, he, what was his thought process? Just a uh, bigger boom. Not, not trying to be show offy, but more like, look, if we continue to do this, we're gonna be here till 10 at night, so then let's put it all in the hole. Let's get out of here. No kidding. How much explosives? Uh, I don't, you know, I, I, let me make the one correction. I was, th that happened when I was the S3, and and I was in uh, Mogadishu when it happened. So, um, so I got investigated for having signed off on the, uh, the range request, and then deployed, and so then, the, the OIC and the uh, NCOIC were the ones that were found like, found responsible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then what other what other major takeaways did you have from battalion command at Ranger Regiment? You guys, you talked about live fire. Yeah. What was uh, how much live fire would you guys do? Live fire maneuver. Well, we we did a lot. We did we did uh, company live fires. So so in that train up for the Rangers to take the mission in a similar way as in the 82nd. We, we would always do a joint readiness exercise, which meant we had uh, helicopter assets uh, from the 160th and from Air Force Special Ops, and you had gunships. And uh, and then, you know, sometimes it would be, there's a there's a, uh, there's a special forces location in Copa, Peru, so we rebuilt it to, uh, um, to seize it back should uh, was a shining path or whatever. Mm -hmm. If they had taken it, then then we would live fire, take it back. So it's always built around some kind of ongoing. Uh, Actual or, objective or, out there. Yeah, yeah. And then, again, you you want Ranger platoons to um, be, be the best platoon size element that can overwatch, support by fire, breach, assault, consolidate, you know, can – uh, breach any any kind of fence door whatever and so you, you, you string a lot of the blocking and tackling and then you put it into a, a concept and um, which is interesting because a lot uh, in the 20-year war which we call this one we, we're uh, just finishing up we're still f working on um, a lot of our officers are sort of like latch you know latch kid key kids they Everything's been given to them. They, they haven't had, had to conceptualize, you know, visualize, conceptualize, put it together, and understand angles and, and um, you know, moving force, stable force. And so I, I think we learned a lot about mm -hmm. about that. Also, in, in range of battalion command, now you one, you have to know things about three levels up. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you're a company commander, you got to sort of know what the battalion commander thinks. But as soon as you get to battalion, then suddenly it's JSOC and all the assets. It's, you know, combatant command and, or their SIF uh, forces, counterterrorist forces, um, host nation and, and uh, partner nations. So there's a lot of that 
I think the biggest thing is how, just how smart the ranger officers and the senior NCOs are. That, that's that's when you realize, oh my goodness, you know. I had four co- company commanders, one of whom is uh, Eric Corella, now a four star. Um, oh, they were all West Point classmates, and they were great guys. And they were, but they they're so smart. And they would vote as a block, so they'd come walking into the office saying, oh, here we go, <laughs> all right. But if I needed to do anything, I would say to to Jeff Martindale, is Eric doing okay? He seems kind of droopy these days. And a minute later, Eric be at my door, sir, what? <laughs> sir, I'm good to go. So I think, you, you know, you learn that, um, that they're not as experienced, but they're, you find out that, wow, these guys are really smart. And the, and the senior NCOs, you know, Probably all NCOs, but you get to see it at the senior level. You know, mm-hmm. really smart. You know, from a training perspective, in the I grew up in the '90s in the SEAL teams, and we did live fire everything. I mean, we did live fire everything. In fact, that was pretty much the only way we trained was live fire. We did live fire IADs. We did live fire IADs at night. We did live fire CQC all the time. That's that's what we did. Blanks kind of wasn't even a thing. Mm-hmm. And I would, you know, hear about the Army, hear about the Marine Corps, and they'd be talking about using blanks. We, used to, I mean, I would personally, my own ego would be like, well, you know, it's so lame that they're doing blanks. And we just did live fire everything. Everything. Everything was live fire. Didn't even think about it. It wasn't even a question what we were doing. We were doing live fire. But in the 2000s, we started actually using both simunition and we had a better form of miles gear mm-hmm. that was very high speed and very very realistic and we started using that and all of a sudden it made us so much better both those things made us so much better and we do less live fire than we used to but we're a lot better mm-hmm. because now we go against we go against an enemy that's maneuvering and shooting back at us and killing us and we're having down men and all that stuff and then when i ran training i i was really focused on that force on force training mm-hmm. did you guys see that did you see that kind of transition as well we did and uh, especially going back and forth from big army to to the rangers you would see and the uh, the advent of the combat training centers, um, Joint Readiness National Training Center, and uh, the uh, CMTC over in Germany. Now you had a world class op for, mm-hmm. and that that's what took the army out of the doldrums of, of post Vietnam. To suddenly, everyone's getting their ass yeah, kicked. You got to fight. You, you got to know. know what you're doing. Yeah, and so then it's like, and then you have world class uh, observer controllers that are saying, you know, you're the 14th iteration of that I've seen, you're not that good. Yeah, you know, yeah. and they were not publicly, but off the side, and it's it's you know some of the same rank is saying, you know, your planning's not that good, your communication's mm-hmm. not that good, your actions on your director aren't that good. So, you know, here's your take home packet, or you get better. Um, and then you got a mission in two days. Yep. You know, there you, you go. didn't you didn't rehearse anything. Get your guys out and rehearse. When did they stand up that NTC? In. Uh, Was it in the 2000s? Was it? Was no, 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 no. It was, it was uh, 80, 85. Oh, okay. 85. So they've had it for a while. Yeah. The, Ar- the Army brought in the combat training center, the Black Hawk, the M1 tank, and the Bradley, all, all within a five-year span. That's a big transition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So you get done with uh, school. You're up there. And then you come. Where do you go back when you, when you get done with that? Where do you go? Yeah. So, um, you know, God had decided that. I was a, a ranger with a capital R, so I should probably command the 75th Ranger Regiment. Didn't happen. <laughs> so they sent me to the 11th Infantry, which is the school brigade. And, you know, talk about humility, um, and, you know, having to suck it up and like, oh my God, you know. Commander Ranger Company, Parachute Company, Parachute Battalion, Ranger Battalion, Ops. And then a training regiment. And then training. And so I had Officer Candidate School, Infantry officer, basic course, jump school, the captain's uh, advanced course or career course, and then a battalion of dogs and cats. And group. now, if you're, we had a little issue with this in the SEAL. We used to have an issue with this in the SEAL teams where no one wanted to go to training, and especially the advanced training, what we now call training detachment, but it used to be called training cell, where you're actually training the platoons that are going to go work, mm-hmm. and. Uh, you learn so much there, number one. But number two, it's real. It seems real obvious that you would want to take your 
best guys and put them where they're training the other guys as opposed to taking the turds yeah. and putting them in charge of training. So did you, were you able to make that mind shift after you got assigned to the training and realize you're gonna have an impact on a bunch of people that are coming through training, including the basic infantry officers course? Yeah, yeah, right away. And, and uh, probably in July of, of uh, 99, I was, you know, moping around and my wife from Norway will say, okay, moping time's over. Let's, you know, what are we gonna do with this? And so the, the entire generation that fought in Iraq and Afghanistan started underneath me, started uh, the captains. I wouldn't allow the captains to stay more than 11 months in any job. So they had to go back to their divisions. Otherwise they were gonna be um, dead in the water. They wouldn't make major. Mm-hmm. And so all these guys learned how to train had first sergeants were running training companies all they were in the, the first wave of captains and many of them are two and three star generals now and all that so big impact and then also well, i got called up to uh a four stars office tradoc commanding general's office and he said that okay you got the lieutenant course they're too soft the lieutenants are a bunch of wimps you know all they do is powerpoint they, they you know once you do a quick study, come back here in three weeks and tell me how you're gonna change based the training for all the officers in the Army. So um, so we found out, we did analysis real quick and found out that of the 16 basic branches, only four qualified with the base, with, a, with a rifle. Uh, Wait, we, out of how many? Out of 16 branches. Ooh. I think it was artillery, infantry. Um, Engineers? Engineers and armor, and everyone else might might fire a weapon, might might not. Wow! Right? And so this is before nine eleven. Um, so I designed the, the course with a, a couple of the, the sergeants and a couple of uh, officers, and and we did the same same thing we did in the Rangers. It's like okay, Monday you're going to the field, you know, and then you're going to shoot every week that you're in the basic course. We pure fleeted that, and then the, the cultures of the other branches, uh, about three years after I left, you know, went to their generals of quartermaster and generals of finance or whatever and got got away. But I also saw the opportunity to um, insert combatives into every course. Mm-hmm. And I had to fight, you know, the big organization. They're like, you can't, you can't do combatives. You don't have. The, the manual says you should have a Fairbairn knife and, you know, fight like the Brits did in World War II. So, so we rewrote that, the TC that you talked about. And the credit goes to Matt Larson and Troy Thomas. Um, Troy's just retired as lieutenant colonel. Matt, um, long friend and uh, black belt for, under Jacare. Um, they did they did the hard work. I did the re- review and all that. <laughs> And, and then they said, you, you can't do it because you don't have any master trainers. So we created a master training course. You can't do it because you don't have a facility. I traded two pallets of MREs for the book warehouse. And this guy was a deer hunter who was the uh, the uh, post ops guy, the military post. And, and I said, hey, Colonel Jordan, I'll give you, what, what, what can I, what do I have to give you to get the book warehouse? He says, well, a bunch of MREs would be helpful because I'm out on the, <laughs> So in OCS, when they finished their last uh, training exercise, they'd just throw MREs into the basement, this big room. So we bundled them up, traded, and then we went to two different high schools and got the first wrestling mat. <laughs> we pieced it together. So you know, again, the lesson learned is reject rejection, and if you know it's right. And then even s- several of the course directors didn't want their lieutenants, captains, or or officer candidates rolling around on the mats and. So we, who says that? Yeah. What kind of, what kind of per- human being? What kind of soldier says, "Hey, I don't want my my troops to learn combatives." Yeah. That seems insane to me. I mean, it was, it was, and so you just play through them. And uh, the captains would sneak down there, <laughs> and and again, all of them ended up being um, combat commanders at, at, as captains and majors and battalion commanders in combat, and, and they all they all got it and. And our NCOs got it right away. It's at the staff sergeant level, they got it right away. And those were all command sergeant majors and, you know, a division and sergeant major in the Army level. Now, And what year is this? This is like around 2000 that all this is happening? It, yeah. Mm-hmm. How long did it take you to get that manual, the, we, the first combatant? I think we published, it, we published it by, uh, I took over July of 99, probably by July of 2000. 
then where are you at when September 11th happens? I was in, uh, standing outside Admiral Natter's office at Joint Forces Command in Norfolk, Virginia. And we were about to go to uh, up to Iceland to do, their, we had an air base up there that we were responsible for. And we were just, he, he was just going to go do a European tour of some sort. So I was in to brief him on the trip, and he and boom, we see the first plane on his TV. Boom, the next, and, and I'd been assigned there four weeks maybe. Hmm. Came out of brigade command again. Was supposed to go to the Pentagon. Was supposed to go to Joint Staff. Ended up in Norfolk. <laughs> yeah, see. What's the mission of Joint Forces Command? It, it was uh, the idea of Secretary Rumsfeld that that um, we needed an honest broker to select. Um, to use the Navy's global force present posture presence, to use the the, the idea of the MU rotation, to uh, division division rotations, brigades, aviation. He he sort of saw that some that, that we were. We needed some broad coordination between all the services yeah, and the, uh, the whole supply chain and all that. It, it was a big time uh, disruptive innovation. Nobody liked Joint Forces Command. Nobody, and uh, <laughs> and so you know it's like. You, Go down Everyone to, wants to just stay in their silo. They do. Yeah, yeah we're, we're happy. No we, one bothers us. We called we called Norfolk the colonies. We'd go up to the Pentagon and say we're going back down to the colonies. You know, so, but uh, so I was there, and then and I'm sitting there thinking I'm going to miss another damn war. I, I cannot believe this. How can I be in the army all this time? And everyone's deploying, and, and then I'm the deputy J three preparing the deployment order for every unit in in, in the military. And I'm thinking, oh shit. And then, um, uh, so we're, I'm there until 2004. So from 9-11 to 2004, watching everyone go to war. And then someone said, you know, you, you'll, you'll make general if you can get your boots dirty. And, you know, you're, everything's good except for you. So then uh, General Honoré and, and uh, General Vines, J.R. Vines, pulled me out of there sent me to be the assistant division commander um, and I had in Iraq I had I had all the MPs all the aviation all the psyops civil affairs and our armies off and so I went everywhere on the road a street that I didn't drive what, on. what year was that 2005 okay and what was your what would explain what, would, what your job was they, they had these separate brigades um, that would rotate in mm -hmm. and there wasn't a division headquarters on top of them a two star and there wasn't a one star and so they were kind of just running their own thing what each brigade combat team was they were uh, aviation brigades okay and military police brigades got it got yeah. it got it okay and so i became the sugar daddy for <laughs> for them <laughs> and how long was that first deployment over there that was uh, j just under six months it wasn't that long and then what was your what was your what were you what was your viewpoint of the war look you watch the thing happen you're kind of detached the first three years of the war mm -hmm. actually first four years of the war you're seeing the direction that it's going uh you know actually I was just talking about on, on this uh, podcast yesterday with uh, a guy who was with me in in the Battle of Ramadi Leif mm -hmm. and I was saying we're we're not winning. We're we're losing this war. This was now in two thousand six. A lot of people weren't saying that. You know, a lot of people were like, "Oh yeah, we're winning." You know, well, my battalion did this many missions. That must mean we're winning. And my brigade did this many missions. That must mean we're winning. And we caught this many bad guys. That must mean we're winning. And so we're winning. And that was there was a lot of that going on. Were you seeing that when you headed over there? Did it look any different when you got on the ground? Were you starting to question whether we were winning or not? Yeah, I I'd, I'd agree with you. I think. Um, first of all, you, you, you saw a lot of uh, transactional, you know, leadership. So in other words, we've got this unit's in, we own this piece of ground, and we're out of here on July 4th. We know that. Mm -hmm. And um, so you saw good hard work, you know, uh, the surge. Uh, the next time I went was at the tail end of the surge, and uh, I went three times. And so I. I would have, people would ask me that, a question like you just said, and I would say, well, when I play golf with my friend Chuck and I hit the ball over the hill and there's water down there, I'll say, Chuck, do you think I went in the water? And he goes, sir, too close to call. And I felt that way about Iraq the whole time. When someone say, are we, 
how's that going to end up? And I'd go, it's too close to call. Um, I think that the Kurds and the Iraqis could screw up anything. And, you know, I hope that doesn't get me in trouble. But culturally, um, they they can't take the win, you know. And uh, I think it's the Arab culture that, you know, they grew all the way back to, to uh, you know, coming out of the, the Far East or these camels and everything, and they, they have to trade. And they say, hey, can we have, I'm the Sheikh, can I have six camels and all those rugs? And the guy goes, no, he, no, 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 no. But the Sheikh was powerful. He'd go back to his village and say, I asked them. They heard what I wanted, you know. We gave them water. They gave me one rug and all that. So the, the traders, they do trading. They also have multiple wives and the wives promote their child and the one who becomes you know when you say abu mosh that's that's the father of mosh so that that tells the tribe mosh or you know abu zaid or abizaid so abu zaid is is the father of zaid and so they so they there's maneuvering always yeah and uh, so they the you know, they know that a new brigade's coming in, new brigade commander, and they can get another suburban when that guy shows up mm-hmm. and all that. So I think I think that that's the problem. And, you know, my, my third job there, third tour, I, I ran the advising and training. So we, my team trained all the national police, the police, the Army, Navy, those small. What uh, year was this? 2010. What did you do on the second deployment? I was DCG for operations, De- Deputy Commanding General for operations at the th- for the Three Star Headquarters under General Lloyd Austin. I I ran uh, the Army Special Ops. We, we had a CJ Soda that you know all about over there, yeah. but within the Corps' area of operations, it, it, it was uh, the CJ Soda really was Arabian Peninsula, mm-hmm. and then inside Iraq itself was uh, w- would be the brigade. Uh, commander or uh, Joint Special Operation Task Force, and I, General Austin gave them to me. He said, "You mm-hmm. you speak their language." And what year was this? Two thousand. It was fifteen months. It was a long tour. Two thousand eight and two thousand nine. So the surge was two thousand eight, right? Uh, six, I think. Six or seven. Yeah, maybe seven. I guess because it didn't. I was in my, my last deployment over there was two thousand six. The surge wasn't happening okay yet. yeah um i'm just trying to figure out when when uh you know what was going on when you were there so you were you had oversight of the siege of Sodif in iraq during that tour the brigade commander everyone's got a thousand fathers you know you mm-hmm. call them back to brag call them, but the brigade <laughs> commander direct reported to me i approved the nightly missions um if you know we went into whatever it was hillier hill whatever it was hala yeah, mm-hmm. and that, that was uh, Prime Minister Maliki's hometown. Mm-hmm. We shot up uh, his nephew or something. We shot at, at our SF guys first, and they shot and killed him. And so then, so I'd meet you're the guy, General Austin, with the photos and with the tape, show it. Then I'd go to the Prime Minister and show him. Um, Here's what happened. You know, da da da. We'd like to pay the family, or we're not paying the family. They shot at our guys mm-hmm. first, and he's dead. Um, did did a lot of uh, EFP hunting you know, as as uh, the the makers or, mm-hmm. or the deliverers coming out of uh, out of uh, Iran, and then uh, did, we had a, we had a Iraqi special forces uh, um, version of they they would live in this camp, take all the uniform off, go home once a month, and then come back and. Nobody knew who they were, but we went into Sadr City. I went in with them a couple times, mm-hmm. and then uh, and then I ran big, uh, high level uh, psychological operations and uh, influencing operations. Now, two thousand eight, when that surge happened, and it sounds like you were there. You started to, you know, this was something I was tracking on, you know, with General Petraeus and no more drive-by counterinsurgency. We had to get out and, and this is what we did in Ramadi, the Battle of Ramadi. We went into the city, you know, and we is the, the 1-1 AD who's going into the city and setting up combat outposts and whatnot. 
you got to see that take place throughout the the whole country um and then did you start to think maybe we can actually for lack of a better word win i think you feel that way first of all commanders are optimists and uh that's a good thing to be um it's a bad thing to not be a realist but um, you could be optimistic and so and then you'd see the gains um being made and and for my role at that time you know i'd roll into a battle space see one of those lieutenant colonels that might have been a captain underneath me previously Mm -hmm. and during those days see how much they've grown up see feel the cohesion of their their organization um see see what traps they were running against the uh Al Qaeda or or whoever, um, so I, I think you, you, you still got to characterize it as optimistic, but also knowing that um, at some point we can't sustain you know eighty thousand men and women here, or we can't sustain this budget, or we can't if if they can't take it over from yep. us, then it's not going to work. Yeah, that was the big thing I had to tell my guys because we had to start working with Iraqi troops. And of course, all my guys are like, you kidding me? These guys are terrible, they're not trained, they're not trustworthy, they don't have any equipment. But what I had to tell them was, hey, if we don't get these guys trained up where they can actually go out and control the level of violence in their city, then we're gonna be here forever. Our sons are gonna be here, that's what it's gonna be. And that's a losing, that's a losing proposition. And the guys understood that and moved forward and certainly we were absolutely successful in Ramadi and and that was based on what uh, General McMaster did up in Talafar, yep, yep. and then General uh, McFarland went and relieved him. And then, since it had been pacified, they took General McFarland and sent him down to Ramadi, who relieved General Gronsky, who went home with his troops. and And that's what they did. They implemented that that strategy inside the city of Ramadi. Go in, set up combat outposts in the neighborhood, start to get to know the local populace and all that. So we and we left, and when we left. Within months after we left, the Ramadi was like a completely different place. There was the level of violence was almost went down to nothing. Uh, you know, you had Sheikh Sattar Bazia was out there. They were forming up there. We had there was like thirty police, thirty Iraqi police that were pretty much collecting a paycheck and not doing anything when we showed up in Ramadi. Now there was two thousand of these guys. Mm-hmm. So there was a massive transition. And it did look hopeful from from our perspective back here, looking at the trans, transition that had happened in Ramadi, and we started seeing it in other cities. And you were there for that. What did that What did that look like on the ground for you? Yeah, that the other big task I had was to convert the sons of Iraq. Um, so, uh, what, what we what we had was one hundred four thousand Sunni men that Sean McFarland st- started uh, getting getting the. Uh, the Sawa or the Awakening going, mm-hmm. and and uh, and so the thought was, hey, if we can get them on on every street corner, then we we can get out of there. I ended up having to uh, brief Maliki about every other week on a Wednesday, and uh, showing him. How, how, we went around to every province. There was a uh, Iraqi uh, Special Forces two star General Muth there, who was sort of there their god you know their warrior god so he and i would go we'd break the shakes we break the u.s brigade commander or the coalition brigade commander um the police we'd get them paid uh three hundred dollars a month and then um after six months then the iraqis would during that time the iraqis would learn to pay them and then after that the iraqis money would pay them and so we, we, we converted it all and then about a year after i left um, the Shia started uh, killing the, the Sunnis, and, and then that drove them into the arms of ISIS, and that drove you know mm-hmm. that surge again. Is there anything that we could have done different in that transitional period? You know, we we ran into all those problems. You know, we had the Shia army coming into Ramadi. The the obviously Ramadi's filled with a bunch of Sunni. We had the Sunni police. Like I said, there wasn't very many of them, but there was definitely some some antagonistic relationships there. But we did see a unification of the Shia army and the Sunni populace against Al Qaeda. Like mm-hmm. we absolutely saw that. They neither one of those people, neither one of those groups wanted Al Qaeda insurgents inside the city. And so there was a brief time of unity. 
but it seems like where we drop the ball is not nurturing that relationship to continue to be positive. Maybe it's impossible. I don't know. Um, but do you think there's anything we could have done better? I think understanding them better is the first step. In other words, because of that brother thing, so it's me against my brother, and then it's me and my brother against another family, Mm -hmm. and then it's our tribe against another tribe, and then it's all the way up to the Muslims against the world. And so um, they're a culture of of, uh, self-interest, and so you have to – the, there's no the loyalty is very low, and so when you say we're going to leave and now you got this, there's got to be something in, right. in, in it for him. And if if you so, what can we do better is find that's whatever that was. Yeah, I was rooting for WalMarts. I thought if there was more WalMarts and you could employ people and they could have a place to go get a job and they would have a place to go and get uh, burgers and get um, you know Cheetos, we'd, we'd made some progress. You know, but we when we left, we just expected things to work themselves out, and what you end up with is a rift. There's no Walmart to, to mm-hmm. get to go and work together at. That's what I'm saying. Like you yeah. want to give them something, give them some kind of commerce, give them some kind of positive, because it, it takes generations mm-hmm. to get rid of. And look, maybe they never get rid of those things, but eventually you're living right next to each other. Eventually, you say, you know what? It's just a little bit easier if we if we all are doing if we're all working together instead of working against each other but we just we i don't think we recognize the depth of the rift Mm -hmm. between the sunnis and the shia which is which is completely pathetic not to recognize that it's pathetic not to understand that i mean to say that to say that we didn't understand it everybody knew it Mm -hmm. i mean look my I, I knew that at my levels. My platoon commanders knew it. My my senior NCOs were like, oh yeah, we've got Sunnis, we've got Shias, we've got to make sure they get along. So we on the ground knew it. But boy, we didn't end up at a higher level figuring out a solution to that stuff. No, no, we didn't. And, uh, you know, creating, you know, within the parliament and then within the pro- provincial, you know, get equal representation mm-hmm. and... Uh, you could even say, I mean, Maliki, so when we got to Ramadi, we thought we actually had the op plan. We were going to do La Fallujah style, just complete smash of Ramadi. We're going to go in there, massive kinetics, and kill all the bad guys and and get rid of them. Maliki said, you know, Maliki's a Shia. And he said, eh, if we do that, if I, if I send my Shia army into Ramadi, which is filled with Sunnis, it's going to look like, you know, it's going to look like uh, extermination. It's going to look like genocide. Can't do that. And so we took a different approach. Mm-hmm. So Maliki understood that. He knew that he couldn't do that. Yeah, we we just didn't. It's like we it's like we just dropped that ball. You know, we're heading towards the end zone. And we just dropped the freaking ball. Yeah, you you think about the uh, you know fifty or sixty years of peace in uh, occupied Germany, um, in Korea in Japan and and uh, because we remained the presence there like yeah. I said learning that as a kid in Berlin and I think when we went back behind the wall of the embassy then you know we were telling first we, we moved our our footprint out to um, Al-Assad mm-hmm. to, in the middle Latin, of nowhere yeah and so now you know they're like there's some Americans here but they're not uh, you know, they don't got skin in the game anymore. Yeah, and it's amazing what the American presence brings to peace. I mean, it really does. Uh, I, you know, when we left, I don't think there's one single military person when we left in 2010, 2011 that thought, "Oh, this is going to go. This is this is going to work smooth now." Mm-hmm. I don't think there's anybody that thought that, and and I don't think it would have taken a huge American presence to keep things. You know, it's like the. The, the school teacher in a room, right? Mm-hmm. The school teacher's in the room. The kids are pretty much doing what they're supposed to do. That school teacher leaves the room. It's mayhem. Mm-hmm. It's mayhem. That's that's what happens. And it's not like the school teacher has equal force to whatever twenty five high school students. They can't. They could easily overpower that high school teacher. But the presence, the understanding of consequences, mm-hmm. the, even the understanding that you're being observed, like all those things, make a difference. And when we when we just walked away, everybody. I mean, I was sick. Everyone was saying, "This is 
well, there's this is going to be this going to be a disaster. And sure enough, it was. Yeah, we we asked for fourteen thousand troops, and uh, and well, as like a permanent presence on the ground. Yeah, and that would have been enough to absolutely, you know, to have a Mosul presence and a you know up by Spiker and then in Baghdad and, and uh, out in the belts. It would have been it would have been enough because now the school teacher size has the sheikhs and, and the Iraqi generals to hold them accountable and to continue to ride around with them and all of that. And, uh, but uh, yeah. that was denied and it went from 4,000, 14 to four to three to two to over the horizon Kuwait. And, and, we, and we just saw how it played out in Afghanistan as well. Mm-hmm. And we also got to see how it played out to have, what was it, 3,000 troops on the ground that were in Afghanistan for 18 months and there was really low levels of violence and you just were gonna let that wound heal. You got to let these let these wounds heal over and let these relationships start to form. And it might, like you said, take a generation or two generations, fifty, sixty years. And in the meantime, okay, it's great. It's good. It's good. It's good training for our guys to be over there and working with these, understanding these different cultures, and and just this this lack of any kind of presence. And then there was the. Um, you know, people were calling Afghanistan like this forever war. It hadn't been a war. It hadn't been a war for the last 18 months before we pulled out. It had been a, a, a peacekeeping observation of what was happening and main, maintaining some presence that that we could continue down the path that we were on. And now, I mean, it's just been a, a complete disaster. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, whenever I hear some, on the news or someone says, you know, the troops are tired of this, Whoever's saying that isn't a troop, you know. <laughs> and you're tired of picking up trash in Fort Riley, and when you're, you know, Division Ready Three, or not having sufficient uh, bullets to to uh, to do live fires, that's when troops get tired. Yeah, and troops get tired. Look, you put them into strenuous combat where they're losing their friends. Yeah, you're going to get tired. But when you say, hey, you're gonna go, your friends and your brothers and sisters in in arms have gone and sacrificed so much, and we're gonna go, but we've gotten to a place, we can maintain this, that's what you're gonna go and do. You're doing something positive and productive in the world. Mm-hmm. Troops say, roger that, I got it, mm-hmm. let's go. Yeah, you're right, there's no there's no fatigue for troops that are going on, de- going on deployment anyways. Let's go do something that counts. Mm-hmm. So we definitely dropped the ball on that. And this is what you saw in your last deployment. So your last deployment was in what year? It was uh, all of 2011. So you were there for the shutdown. Yeah, I, I, I was asked to stand up the Office of Security Cooperation, which uh, we have we have around the world different different names, mill groups, Office of Security Cooperation, Office of Defense Cooperation. So this was called security. And um, I worked for... Uh, Ambassador Jeffers and General Austin at the same time, and knowing that my replacement, who was uh, going to be Bobby Castlin, General Castlin, um, that he would be working for the ambassador out of the embassy, um, so, and so we downsized to ten locations um, where we would have mostly contractors who would just maintain the helicopters, maintain the M1 tanks that we gave them, maintain. The, the uh, MRAPs and teach their, them the maintenance. And so that that was, General Austin was a four star, I was a three star. And this was your second time working for General Austin? It was. Yeah. And how was your relationship with General Austin? It was great, yeah. And, and his attitude about all this, was he, did he have the right focus? Did you feel like comfortable with the decisions he was making? I, I did, yeah. And uh, he, he's, uh, he, he's a really, really great leader. It, I don't know what's going on in his current job. You know? mm-hmm. um, and I, I haven't spoken to him in a couple of years, but uh, he, he, you know, fight for the troops, take care of the troops, you know, what, what go after someone when they're bad, bad guys. He doesn't, he's, he, he's gonna let loose the dogs of war. Um, he's a very thoughtful, big thinker in, in that regard. Um, understood, you know, his role was setting conditions and being out here and then being in the street where the troops can see him and then letting his layers of two stars and brigade commanders or uh, squadron commanders do their part so and then so so are you there when 
the actual pullout happens when we're, when we're finally done? No, I, I left November 2nd, and um, I think they went out um, two months later or something like that. Am I accurate when I say that people, that everyone that was in the military looked at it and, and uh, thought it was going to be a disaster? Did you think that too, or did you have hope? When we're resourced, I had hope, and, and going down to 2000, not, not having a presence, uh, then that, that would be hopeless. And in your circles, you know, with General Austin, is there pushback going back up the chain of command? Are people saying, hey, you know, Mr. President, this is, look, we got a bunch of people that are saying this isn't going to work out well. Is that what's happening? It is, yeah. And, and, do you think it's political pressure on President Obama that makes him say, "Yeah, you know what? We're 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 out." I, I think um, you know an Israeli officer taught me once: the first rule of the regime is to remain the regime, and the second rule of the regime is to remain the regime. And so, yeah, I, I think uh, the polling or anything else, mm-hmm. the news cycles, um, they were playing that more than um, the national strategic and defense. Which is strange because Obama's an articulate guy that I think could do a good job of selling, what's the, selling snow to an Eskimo? Mm -hmm. He seems like that type of guy that could say, hey, here's the situation, we thought we're gonna be able to leave, looks like that, that's not gonna be the best plan, here's our our adjustment. Does that make sense? I think so, I think so, Um, I, you know, I think politics drove it. Why they did, I don't know. You know why he would choose this that way versus another. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know. So. And and it's just a complete create a complete vacuum over there. Yeah. Again, I go back to 1968 Berlin. You know, the, if we had, if we had pulled out of Berlin, leaving a German force there, the Russians would have gone that day and taken it. <sighs> There's a book, I haven't covered it on the podcast yet, it's called The Donkeys. And it's written by a guy uh, that kind of observed, he wasn't in World War I, but he, he observed what the generals did in, and, the, and the military and government leadership in World War I. And he, he wrote this book, he wrote it a long time ago, but it, it's called The Donkeys. And it comes from that quote that everyone's heard. Usually they say lions led by lambs or something along that. That's what they would say about the British, or that some German said that about the British. The actual quote was lions led by donkeys. That's what the Germans said about the Brits. And this guy wrote this book just talking about what, what, it, you know, the, what terrible leadership it was. And I don't know, I'm thinking of, uh, I think of a lot of these leaders that we have nowadays as being donkeys especially when you see these collective decisions where it's like everybody knows, everybody can see. Same thing with Afghanistan. There's not one military person that thought that was gonna go well. Mm-hmm. Not none, none. And yet the the leadership is executing on these terrible plans. <sighs> okay, so <laughs> you get done with that. Um, and I think what we I think we skipped when you were when you were at the um, what 18th Airborne Corps. We skipped uh, what as a two star um, commanding Fort Benning. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. And again, that so Benning as lieutenant, Benning as a captain in the careers course, Benning as a major in third range battalion, Benning as a battalion commander, lieutenant colonel, Benning as a brigade commander, and then back for two stars. Um, so we would tell the housing office, we're coming back. So you, you better take <laughs> keep, care of these families. House. You, better, you better square these people away, um, these young soldiers and their families. Um, so so I, another transformation job, you know, I had a lot of them in each of these that we've talked about, you know, transforming the Sons of Iraq to be Neighborhood Watch instead of Al-Qaeda, right. um, transforming the way – Soldiers uh, fight hand to hand. That that story about transforming the sons of Iraq before they were sons of Iraq, they were called something else, and I can't think of it right now. Um, but it had started out in Al Qaim. Yeah, yeah, and and they had the Marines had said, "Hey, these locals are telling us what's going on." Desert Protector—that's what they called uh. them—and they formed this program called Desert Protector. 
And so the first meeting that we had, my, my information operations officer had with Sheikh Sitar Bazia, he said, we want to be desert protectors. And so I got that information and I kind of started, I, I tried to figure out what the desert protectors were. Desert protectors had been shut down because Maliki didn't want a bunch of Sunni tribal uh, rebels running around that were armed by Americans. So I had to tell Sheikh Bazia, hey, it, it's not desert protectors anymore. It's now called Iraqi police and we can get you trained. And then he was like, that sounds good. And then the, the 1-1 AD came in and mm-hmm. Colonel Dean and Sean McFarland and they took over and ran with it and it was great. But uh, the, the, the way those things happen was, and then after that came the Sons of Iraq. Mm-hmm. That's when they, we I, actually, my, my guy came back with the document that they had created, like the first one. And he, he showed it to me and I was like, what is, you know, we had the translator go through it and it was pretty neat to see that stuff unfold like that. Yeah, yeah it was. And, you know, uh, a common theme on all of this is kind of the sparkle in the eye of a young soldier or Marine or SEAL, you know, that they realize, you know, we're doing something now. This is pretty squared away. Um, at Fort Benning, uh, uh, General Dempsey told me, um, I want you, he was the trade doc commander, I want you to bring the armor school from Fort Knox, Kentucky to Fort Benning and change the infantry center into the maneuver center of excellence. Mm-hmm. They're walking the streets together anyways, yep. tankers and you know artillery, everyone's, everyone's doing it. So trying to bring the infantry and the armor and the cavalry together is the, the Shia and the Sunni and the Kurds. <laughs> so I was, I was trained in many ways. Yep. But and and then always having the old sheikh, so all the retired generals, I I'd go to and I'd say, you know, re- retired four star armor guy. Look, I didn't make this stuff up. We're we're bringing the armor school. Yeah. You need to be, you know, an ambassador for the good yeah, idea. And by the way, doesn't everyone agree that it's better when we all work together? Right, right. Well, doesn't is there anyone that thinks we're 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 going to go and you know branch off and become our own country no we're going to work together as the united states of america this is what makes sense we all have supported each other on the battlefield mm-hmm. wouldn't it be better if we actually trained that way yeah. but them rice bowls those silos exactly exactly and and uh the the platform of the tank um is really important to the armor guys and so the, they will always maneuver jobs and positions where they can protect the budget line mm-hmm. for that. that would, I'll, I'll get a call on that one, but that's all right. right. Well, I'm a huge supporter of tanks myself. Yeah, I yeah. actually love tanks, and I love tankers, and God bless them. You know, we fight as a team. You know, we deploy as a team. You, when you need help, you shift assets, and they show up, and you love them. And, you know, stack stack the planes, you know, to the moon mm-hmm. over the head of a, a SEAL platoon or a Ranger platoon, and it, that's all good, you know. But that, but that, that took a lot of leadership. Um, two years to to uh, pull, actually it was about fourteen months of command, and then I went back to Iraq as the three star. And then I and then I came out of there and took command of all the army bases around the world. So I ran seventy five cities in seventeen time zones with one hundred and twenty three thousand employees, delivering about three hundred services every single day from child development centers to. At that point, 70 golf courses, which I thought I should inspect myself. <laughs> but also then I realized, hey, guess what? I have every gym. Maybe we'll have mats in most of those gyms. That's a good spot. Yeah. Before we jump into the the gyms and the jujitsu and the mats and the gyms of the however many gyms you own now that you are in this in this position, before we were t- before we hit record today, and since we were talking about donkeys, uh, you mentioned that your father-in-law actually worked with Colonel David Hackworth in Vietnam. Correct. Give me some. Give me some stories. Come on. The, 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 what was the situation? So that they were. Uh, it's probably 1967-ish. Let's just say that. And so, uh, my father-in-law um, then was Lieutenant Colonel Promotable John Hemphill. Class of 51, West Point. And David Hackworth was, I, I'm pretty sure, a brigade commander. And he might have, I'm pretty sure. Anyways, there were orders that came out of the, the, the 101st Division headquarters telling uh, Colonel Hackworth 
to do this or that, or the word came out late, or or, or helicopters didn't show up but for whatever reason. He, uh, Colonel Hackworth, stormed up into division headquarters, a bunch of tents in the jungle, and uh, started telling everyone how, that they'd really screwed up, and and uh, they were a bunch of jerks and unprofessional. <laughs> and so my father-in-law stepped in between. Uh, Colonel Hackworth and, and his his people and said let's take this outside and talk it through and Colonel Hackworth allegedly uh, reportedly said no you know I'm not going anywhere and so then they they got it on right there started the fight in the tent and <laughs> rolled out into the darkness and and uh, but they remained great friends until my father-in-law passed away about two years ago but they they were fond of each other they knew that each was a warrior and uh, that uh, you know, you're gonna have disagreements, get it on, and then get over it. Now, when I was kind of uh, becoming a, a disciple, I guess, I don't know if there's such a thing, but kind of when I started really getting uh, interested in Hackworth and I was reading his books and reading them again and starting to see a lot of good leadership in there, he was absolutely, he was absolutely hated in the entire Navy because he had done a report, he had done some reporting on the chief of naval operations at the time, Admiral Borda, who was a beloved guy, who was a prior enlisted guy that had come up through the ranks to become the chief of naval operations. And Colonel Hackworth had done a report on him that he was wearing some unauthorized and unearned uh, awards on his uniform. And Admiral Borda killed himself. So he wasn't popular there. <laughs> he wasn't popular in the Navy at all. The Army, I pretty much got mostly the same thing from the Army that you know Hackworth Hackworth was just bad now recently I've talked to I actually went out to West Point and when I went when I was at West Point they I would I, I asked the question hey how does everybody view Hackworth now and they pretty much say I mean a, a paraphrase is Hackworth was right what, what did you did you what, like you, you did you know about Hackworth from your from your dad or anything like that? Just just a little, just especially when About Face first came out, and uh, General Hemphill handed me the book, and told me to read it, and uh, um, and then told the story. So, but he was what? Did, what did your father in law think of the book? Um, well, he thought it was good enough to give it to me. To oh, read. Okay, yeah. that's a good point. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because you know you read the book, and you, as you read the book. You can go, and I, I actually had these thoughts, and I thought, you know, what was he, I mean, you know, you write a book about yourself, of course you're gonna put yourself in the good light, you're gonna make yourself look good, you're gonna pull the quotes that make you look good, you're gonna tell the story that makes you look good. And I had a guy named General Jim Mukayama on the podcast who was one of Hackworth's company commanders in Vietnam, and I was really excited. I'm like, now I'm gonna get the, I'm gonna get the real story on what Hackworth was really like, what they really thought of him, what was he like for a commander. And you know, so I asked uh, General uh, General Mukayama, and he he couldn't have given Hackworth any higher praise. Mm -hmm. I mean, he absolutely just loved Hackworth, and he told me that everybody in the army knew who he was. He said when he checked in at Fort Lewis, when when Hackworth checked in, uh, Mukayama was working like the 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 desk, the admin desk, or personnel desk, or he was an aide or something. He was, but he was the kind of the young lieutenant checking him in. And I said, did you know who he was? And he said, everybody knew who he was. Mr. Infantry, everybody knew him. Everybody knew his reputation. So I thought that that was very reassuring to me. So this is now more reassuring that uh, getting word via your father-in-law that Hackworth was the real deal. They, both, both of them, um, you know, back in, in those days that body count was, was a measure of success or effectiveness. And so both Hackworth and, and uh, Margie's dad, gen later General Hempel, um, turned people in who who doctored the books, and uh, so the Margie's dad was was the first West Point guy of, of his class to make O six, and he was the last West Point guy of his class to make one star. And all the generals that that uh, he reported had f falsified. Uh, the number of Vietnamese being killed, or South Viet North Vietnamese, or Viet Cong, you know, he he rendered a report that is not true, and uh, it went all the way back to uh, mm -hmm. to the Pentagon, and th all all those guys that were three and four, five years ahead of him that sat the promotion boards, cut them out, and when the last one retired, the next day he he, he made, or the next board he yeah. made, so 
I think that's you know that that's an, the, the lesson of leadership is is can you stand strong when others won't, and can you stand strong when it's uh, personally and professionally not in your interest, mm -hmm. and uh, and do the right thing, and and we need we need a lot of that, we need more of that, and we need to celebrate it when we see it. Do you remember? Because it's 1989 when, when this book came out. Do you remember when it came out? Was it a big deal in the army? Were people passing it around? Were people saying it was a bunch of crap? There were, there were yeah, there were lovers and haters. Mm -hmm. 89, I was in uh, Second Range Battalion mm -hmm. out at Fort Lewis. My father in law had retired in 85 out at Fort Lewis. And so, um, like it or not, every Sunday we were over at their house, you know, for Sunday afternoon dinner. And, and uh, I became. Uh, I loved my father-in-law and liked him, but it would be, you know, come over, have a beer. We're going to watch football. <laughs> Absolutely. Mandatory but, fun. But when, but when the book came out, that's why it's so easy for him to say, hey, read this now. And uh, the, there were some that, uh, you know, another thing for our generation, we sort of look, looked at um, if the person wasn't charismatic in a big way, we didn't want to hear about back in Vietnam. So in, in many camps, the book that describes a warrior leading uh, in time of combat was probably a little bit uh, over, overcast or overshaded by the context of it was Vietnam. So, Well, what, what gave you guys that, that uh, opinion? Was it like, hey, Vietnam... We we know all about Vietnam. Was it? Hey, Vietnam was your. It was a different dis, different situation that doesn't convey to what we have to deal with now. A little bit of a little bit of, of that that doesn't convey that doesn't match up. But the other was the the context of arriving in your first units and your captain screwed up and your sergeants have two or three DUIs and you know they're, they're the carryovers and then they start telling you you know you got to be squared away like we are and you're looking thinking you know young and full of life and going. I'm, I'm not sure I agree that you're squared away, you know, and uh, so so then when we're in the basic course or the campus course and someone said, well, back in Nam, you're like, oh, please. Yeah, I kind of look at you now. Yeah, and then, we, you know, the, in time they sunset and, you know, the, the new uh, non-commissioned officer, uh, the more professional uh, on purpose, using those words literal, a mm -hmm. plan to make them professional came in. We, we called the you know, the sergeants in Vietnam shake and bake, mm -hmm. right? And so nowadays people don't know what shake and bake is, but back in those days it was a pouch of, of uh, breadcrumbs <laughs> and you put the chicken in it and you shake it up and then you bake it and you have Kentucky Fried Chicken. Well, they made sergeants uh, shake and bake, in other words, after about a month or two uh, in the combat zone, they put pinned rank on them and said, you're now an NCO. And, Many of them, they didn't have basic NCO course, advanced NCO course, you know, um, primary leader development course. They didn't have that non-commissioned uh, officer school like we do today, like we did in the 90s and, and 2000s. So, so uh, anyways, point is when, uh, when, when his book came out, probably half the people were like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm not sure of, of the lessons of Vietnam are going to be relative, relative mm -hmm. to me or pertinent when in fact you know leadership is transcendent yeah and the other thing is it seemed like well, like I came in in 1990 1990 it didn't seem like we were gonna have another big long prolonged war mm -hmm. you know like there was we all thought we'd do one mission you know do one big mission and that would be that the big mesh there was no oh, look and then and then the first Gulf War was over in 72 hours. Okay, well, that's what war is now. Mm -hmm. you, you, maybe we'll fight for, you know, maybe we'll do one big mission in a 72-hour war, but that's what war is going to be like from now on. It wasn't going to be this 10-year thing like Vietnam where you've got all this experience and you're going to be out doing all these operations night after night after night. And boy, were we wrong about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, all right. So I just wanted to get some, get your perspective on Hackworth. I appreciate that. Now, you were just saying you took over all the bases uh, in the world, that's right? You, the Army bases, yeah. All the Army bases in the world, which means you're in charge of the golf courses. I'm not a golfer, but it means you're in charge of the gyms, and inside gyms, you can put mats. Now, at this point, I think, uh, t 
2012, I saw an article that you got your brown belt from Jacare. Mm-hmm. Not the Jacare that you know from UFC out right. there, everybody. The old school Jacare, who's a, a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt from the previous generation. An old school. I went there and trained in, a, in his school when I went from officer candidate school in, in Pensacola, Florida. Yeah. And I was going to SEAL Team 2 at Virginia Beach. And I stopped in in Atlanta and Ooh. trained for seven days. Oh. Just went and trained every day, all day. That was in, two, that was in 1998. Okay. So you're a brown belt at this time. You've been, you kept training jujitsu, which right. is awesome. And, n- and now you have the opportunity to start putting some combatives training areas in all these different gyms. So how was that? Well, like anything else, it, 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 it took, you know, one, two, three cups of tea. So go, go to the location, meet with the, the two star general and, and you know where you have your guys. So you, you already know Sergeant so-and-so there, Major so-and-so's there. And so you go to the general and say, um, resources are tight in the Army. They always are, but I can square you away. And so we can, we can build a, a world-class facility here. Which gym would you want to put it in? So rather than saying I own the gym and have the truck show up in the middle of the night with mats, mm-hmm. to, for the program to stay alive, that general needed and his sergeant major needed to uh, – to want it and and for the most part they did and so we went to fort drum then to fort campbell then to fort lewis and and some of them now have huge train facilities that they spawned off of the original gym idea and so the the uh the strategy was um take away any excuses for people not training their people and uh oh you know you know we we got basketball intramurals You'll get, you'll be okay. You're going to be, you'll have enough, you have 12 gyms at Fort Bragg. You're going to be okay. And then all oh, people get hurt. No, more people get hurt playing racquetball mm-hmm. in Army facilities than training jujitsu and or combatants. And then mostly, you know, I, I just don't want a generation uh, to be asked by their grandson, you know, did you ever get in a fight, Dad? A granddad? And he's no, but I, but I can, I can put a PowerPoint presentation together like you've never seen. You know, it just that's not the warrior ethos. And you said it early. Um, if there was a place where the eternal flame of warrior ethos should burn, it should be Fort Benning, in front of the the the, uh, the main building there. And as Fort Benning and the infantry go, so goes the army. And as the warriors of each service go, so goes their their warrior uh, their warrior ethos. So, so uh, you know, no one likes change but a baby with a wet diaper, right? And so when you, when you show up and tell the guy who's in charge of all the gyms who works for you that we're going to do this, and he says, no, sir, you know, that's mission money, not, not morale money. And, and you, you tell him, you know, do you think um, you, taking that stance is worth your job? Because I, one of my guys said, just unencumber their future. And I said, you know, this program is going to happen, so let's all be <laughs> – for something that's going to happen. And that's what Stan McChrystal told me. You know, we're going to do this. So be for it big time because you'll love, you'll love your life much more than if you drag your heels. So that, that guy three years later um, was two thumbs up. And he, he had been a wrestler. So he was a Department of the Army civilian. He'd been a wrestler. He was just reading the, you know, he, was, he wasn't doing what's right. He was doing it right. And I said, let's do what's right instead. Change the manual. Mm-hmm. So I, I had to do it to, to get there. If your MWR manual says the gyms are solely for the use of, you know, uh, after hour, you know, basketball, volleyball, and intramurals, change it. And for use by, you know, soldiers and uh, training. Go for it. Too easy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and the, and it really is impressive the Army combatives. They have the combatives tournaments, yeah, which are which are pretty awesome. Um, is that just coming from Matt Larson? Did they come up with that idea? Uh, yeah. And Troy? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I have a picture on my wall in the museum of about 28 people. We're all in the Army Green uh, wood, Woodland BDUs. Mm-hmm. Matt's in the picture. Troy's in the picture. A young Colonel Ferreter's in the picture. That was the first Army Combatives tournament. <laughs> And then, and uh, and I, I kind of just closed my eyes as you started talking because just last week was the twentieth. Okay. And I and I got too busy and I couldn't go down there. They invited me and all that. Matt is the 
the father of army combatives and, and I'm the godfather. Okay. <laughs> I was going to guess grandfather, but yeah. maybe that would have been a bit much for you. Well, no, I, I take that too. Um, <laughs> grandfathers have unconditional love for their grandkids. But um, when someone messes with the program, then I show, I'll show up again mm-hmm. and just go close the door with the, whoever it is and say, you know, if, if, you, if, if I say to you, you, you want to shoot, a, you want to go shoot a sniper rifle, you want to go shoot the Barrett? Oh, yeah. You want to drop a mortar around? Oh, yeah. You know, you want to shoot the machine gun? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, pull a lanyard on an artillery piece? Yeah. You want to go down to the mats? Oh, well, my back is, you know. And I, I told, I tell the senior officials, just don't say no. You don't have to, you know, if you're not into it, that's fine. I think you should be into it. I think you should try it enough, you know, do jujitsu or any other martial art enough that you understand what it is. And if that doesn't move you, then, then don't be moved. That's fine. But, but don't make it, you wouldn't make it that decision on anything else as a leader. But on this one, there's so much ego and, uh, oh, yeah. or lack of humility. I came up with a protocol for how long you need to train jujitsu for because I get asked this question a lot by by people that don't really like it for whatever reason it's sweaty it's hot their egos getting crushed and I said to you my protocol now I tell people is you train jujitsu until you tap someone out and then if you say if you don't if you get that feeling of tapping someone out and you don't say yes it's pretty cool then maybe jujitsu isn't for you, but yeah, you at least like need that. to train that that long. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> so then you, 2014, you actually get promoted to black belt once again from Jaco Ray. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you were training, when you were overseas, when you were on deployment, were you training? Did you guys? Did you ha- have enough guys to train with? Yes. Yeah. yeah. You the, always found people to train. Yeah. Nor, thinking that. Um, or, or understanding that I started training as a full colonel. So I really started. How old were you when you started training? Probably 43, 44. Check. So I, I, we, we took 18th Airborne Corps in, into Iraq in 2008, January 2008. We stayed till June of, roughly June of 2009, 15 months ish. The second plane, had the mats <laughs> <laughs> and and I brought I just sent a picture to Henner uh, I'm sorry to Huron and, and uh, Guy Valente in Miami mm-hmm. the Valente brothers and uh, I, I brought them over and they they gave seminars at 28 different operating bases nice. yeah and and uh, and so over there yes um, when deployed keep doing it I, we, we built a, a gym next to the embassy and union three across the street from the embassy and part of it was probably something like uh 70 feet by 70 feet of that beautiful and then someone you know went to the ig and said that you know i misused the gym i I built it for my personal you know and and it's like look we built it for everybody and we want everybody training you know you you would want a, a squad leader or a young nco with a team of four or five to come in there three times a week and, and go through situations. Okay, we're in a room, they grab you. Now what? Now yeah. what? Now what? So, so yeah, so I, I continued to train and then was uh, graduated to Black Belt by Jockery and Matt. Um, oh, awesome. Yeah. And, and, uh, Is Matt, did Matt get his Black Belt from Jockery? He did. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And now, 2014, this is, what, what, was, that, was that your last tour? It was, yeah. I, I retired in June of 2014. And then what did you do once you retired? Um, so I went out to uh, Fort Lewis, took Margie back to the hometown where her mom and dad and her four of her sisters were, and I told her, when you're sick and tired of your four sisters, we'll go somewhere else. So we were there about two years, and she looked over and said, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> and then Dan was deploying to... Uh, and how many kids do you have? Four, yeah, two boys and two girls. Megan, age 42, Dan, age 40, Patty, 38, and uh, Mary Whitney, about 35. How old are you? 66. Nice. And you still train? I do. That's Hell outstanding. Yeah. <laughs> Echo has spoken. I'm getting better, man. I'm getting better all the time. You get on the mats, you know. Um, do you do, what do you do for workout besides jujitsu? Do you lift weights every day? Do you calisthenics every day? Do you do nothing at all except jujitsu? No, I, I, I'll get about 10 workouts in a week. And uh, 
I stopped running. I'm about to restart. But mm-hmm. in, uh, when COVID hit, we got locked down into Monterey, and, and uh, it wasn't too bad. Um, Good place to be locked down. And my, uh, three of my grandkids were there, and we started just getting a cup of coffee and walking them. And so we would walk, you know, eight miles, walk out into the valley and back. Um, but then I'll, I'll do weights. I, I do the Peloton bike. Um, I, I'm now sort of in the build the quads, working the quads and, mm-hmm. and lower legs quite a bit. Um, and then golf. I, I'll, I'll play golf uh, about – I, and I and I'm I'm in this you know skills and drills I'm not in the score and you're never going to get me pissed off on a golf course you know mm-hmm. with all the stuff that we've seen in our life it's like it, look it's just you know <laughs> it's mechanical you, you can't hustle you can't try harder you can't motivate yourself you got to strike the ball mm-hmm. with, you know but uh, so that's what I do yeah and then and then currently you've got the National Veterans Memorial and Museum okay. and and tell us how that came about. Yeah, so when when I retired, I started the Ferreter Group, and we, we decided that we would help transitioning veterans, help find employment and, and all. And like I said, in our store now at the museum, every, you know, something like 48 different companies, um, all veteran-owned or have their merchandise and product. We have books uh, in there. We should take yours as well. We have... Uh, um, and then, then when we bring an exhibit in there, so anyways, I, so I set out in 2014 to help. I also started hands-on inspired leadership, which really is using jujitsu as a metaphor for life to close the distance, establish the dominant position, and finish. And then giving that to high schoolers, did all the medics and, and nurses at in, uh, the hospital uh, at, at uh, Fort Lewis, did the freshman class at the Citadel three years in a row. And basically, you're you know telling young girls, it's like women empowered. You know, your body is your body. You can say, "Stop right there. Take two steps back." You can tell alcohol, "Stop right there. Get back." We can defeat suicide. We can defeat depression. We can defeat clock. And so, I'm I'm still on that mission. We right now I'm working with the Columbus Police Department to set up a Hoyle hands-on inspired leadership with them because they they do have jujitsu instructors, but that's the sports side or the or the I love it side but how do you decompress someone you know I've got a picture of uh, uh, Ball uh, my my executive assistant puts the rubber band on the next one on the next one and so it's, it's about the size of a baseball and I took a picture of it and, and I said to uh, someone that's what PTSD is that's what PTSD is right there and you gotta take that apart one by one by one until the tension's gone but you can best do that through healthy activities, through sports, through jiu-jitsu, through the connection that comes in the gym when all those guys that we just walk by, you just feel mm-hmm. it, right? So um, so um, then I started helping companies. If, if you tell someone that you ran all the Army bases around the world, you had a $12 billion a year budget, you took it down to nine, that you have more than 200 parachute jumps and four combat tours, they say, you know, Thanks for your service, you know. But you tell them that those bases, you were dispersing the checks, then people say, oh, now you're a consultant. So so Mike Ferreter helps companies connect wherever they need to be connected. So into the military or um, Army Air Force Exchange Service, we do that. And we, and we do it for the right reason. We do it because there's someone out there making goodness happen and we want your grandkids to say granddad whoever thought of helping you out to get that product and big lots is another another friend of ours that pretty big um west point graduate is their ceo bruce thorne and and, uh, he wants to help veterans too so then so i get this call uh first 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 i went to uh three things happened senator isaacson and i said i will fix the va i just fixed the biggest part of the army and uh and so i interviewed with the president team eight lawyers and um the wall street journal announced that i was a finalist to be the secretary of the va and the next day president trump went in and said to secretary Wilkins, just keep it you're doing great and the team (laughs) so then um i interviewed to be the president and ceo of the wounded warrior project 
and uh, my good friend Mike Lennington got the job. He's done a fantastic job. So then I got a call to come and interview to be the president of the Citadel, which is when you figure out how I ended up at the Citadel, that's kind of comical to think about that. And then my classmate and friend, Marine, retired four-star, Glenn Walters, got that. So I turned to Margaret. I said, man, I'm not too good at getting jobs. Oh, for three. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she said, ah, you know, we, we know we're unencumbered. We're free to do whatever we want. And then I got a call from a lady in Corn Ferry in Atlanta. And uh, her secretary said, can you take a call on Friday with, uh, with, with Jane? And I said, of course. And uh, so then I said, hey, wait a minute. Your, your phone number, your prefix is 706. Are you in Atlanta? Yeah. I said, well, I'm going to be in Atlanta on Friday. Can I just see her face to face? And she said, I said, if that's breaking the rules, no problem. But she said, yeah, yeah, come on on. So I went in. I interviewed with this headhunter. And uh, we hit it off pretty good. And when I was leaving, she said, who else are you going to see in Atlanta today? I said, no one. Just came up here to see you. <laughs> I said, have you ever hired anyone on the phone? No. So, so then they took me to uh, Columbus, Ohio, living in Columbus, Georgia, and <laughs> interviewed me. And they said, what do you think of this National Veterans Memorial Museum or nationalvmm.org for, for the listeners? And uh, it is John Glenn was the senator, the astronaut, the fighter pilot, the test pilot. And he would look down on the old vets, and then he would call the titans of industry in Columbus, Ohio, and say, that, that is not a fitting. That's not good for, for our vets. It's an old, raggedy-looking thing. So they knocked it down, and they built this beautiful facility. And when they walked me in— What uh, year was that built? Uh, 20. 17 2016 okay, so again it looks like it's brand new yeah it's beautiful I, so i'm the founding ceo and president of it they said what do you think you know general ferreter and i and i said it's insufficient to our need and they said oh my god we put 62 million dollars in there what we forget i said you you forgot that there's veterans in san diego and there's veterans in tampa and there's veterans in fort lewis and iowa and they're not coming to ohio so we're gonna need so they, they, they said, so, so what, what, what's that, you know, smarty pants? What are you going to do? I said, well, we'll have virtual tours, and <clears throat> we'll have a veterinary store, and we'll bring product in and help veterans that are small business owners. I said, we'll go to Ohio State University, and we'll have a leader certification course for veterans. And so when, when you get asked that question as a veteran, you don't have any continuing education. What have you been doing at night? And the answer is, yeah, patrols in Ramadi. That's what I was doing, you know. And so we've run four semesters of leader certification. They get six hours of master's credit. Um, you can take it from right here, right? Um, and so we're growing that program. I, I, this is like off the cuff. This, you know, and you know, it did pretty much nice meeting. Anything you want to say? And then, and I told them um, that. We would probably have a wellness and resilience program with things like jujitsu and, <laughs> and yoga, which we have, and we've had for two years. Um, and I told them that uh, we'd have young inner city youth, especially as youth ambassadors, and we'd run summer camps um, on them. See if you can see it. There's a big giant field right there. And, uh, and so now, and, and when we run the summer camp, the coach will be a policeman another first responder and a veteran hmm. and these kids that are throwing water bottles at cops and and uh, vilifying cops and and all this they'll get to know that these are men and women of character who give a shit about people and are leaders so the national veterans memorial museum one of our mottos is more than a museum and i'm an army ranger more than a history guy and uh, but we can build teams and then we don't need to own anything but we started an employment service now uh, we call it veteran concierge, so we connect uh, big companies and little companies to veterans. And we have an IT solution that that um, called Opline, and it'll um, you you just fill out a checklist. Went you know went to boot camp, went went to buds, went to here, deployed here, got this college, this this, have a driver's license, you know, I'm a sniper, and then it'll say um, you're fully qualified. And here's the kicker. You're fully qualified um, for these 14 jobs in these seven companies in these different parts of the, of the nation. 
And so when a veteran's going through that now, instead of going all the way through the, the employment thing and then they say, oh, you're just not a perfect fit, and he's got to start over, start over. So we're, we're in our pilot year, probably best way to say it, and uh, all of those were the original vision of what we could do and, and much, much more, so we're, we're getting after it. And you got your uh, bride away from her four sisters? I did. <laughs> <laughs> the bonus program. Yeah, and the other thing that's interesting in that regard is we bought a house in Ohio, in Columbus, Ohio, and that is the first house that I've ever purchased. Wow. Because I've always been on Army bases or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So life is good. Well, uh, that, does that get us up to speed? Is that, is that pretty much where we're at? This gets us to today? It does. And um, where can people find you? Uh, they can find me at nationalvmm.org or mferreter at nationalvmm.org or mike at the ferreter group. Okay. And the Fer- you got the ferretergroup.com, I'm assuming as well. Mm-hmm. And then you're on social media? I, I am. I'm, I'm on LinkedIn and Facebook, uh, Instagram. And, and and then the social media of our museum is eye watering. It's just fantastic. So, okay, what's the what's the social media of the um that's the one I don't have. I have I have you on Instagram at, at uh Mike Ferreter, on Twitter, Mike underscore Ferreter, and I have Facebook at Michael Ferreter. What's the what's the social media of the national yeah, I would VMM? Go, I would go to nationalvmm.org which would give you the landing page. And just scroll down. And then just hit it, yeah. Okay, awesome. And what do you, what do you guys post on there that on the social media side? Our podcasts are on, on our Facebook. Okay, and, awesome. And then uh, one, of the, one of the things in that same discussion interview, I, I said, you know, we'll do these podcasts and, and in essence, um, we'll have a virtual a museum hall. So whether it's short stories or uh, whether it's a you know, 30 minute to 50 minute, um, you'll be you can qu- be able to query and say, I- I'm interested, you know, in uh, Vietnam era guys. I'm interested in in World War II. I'm interested in lessons learned in leadership. And so, so it's like we have 35,000 square feet of museum. Um, we've got about nearly 4,000 square feet of mats. Just saying. <laughs> and then, uh, but but we can have 350,000 square feet. A virtual museum hall. Yeah, you can. And we'll never run, you know, like, what did I hear, 386? Yeah, this is podcast number 386. Yeah, see? I mean, you got you got your your own, uh, you know, virtual museum storytelling uh, opportunity here. And people can go and they can get, hear, hear about Hackworth directly. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. Uh, Echo Charles, yeah. any questions? Yeah. What are the rules for that combatives tournament? Because I mean, how do they differ from like you know your general jujitsu tournament rules? Yeah, the the beginning. Um, so I think there are three levels now. One is one is it's straight combatives. They're they're wearing uh, the army battle dress uniform or fatigues. Level two, as you advance, then uh, kicking and striking, the torso. And then in the finals, kicking and striking, in a, just like a like USA. MMA scenario. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the first level is essentially like general jujitsu rules. You got points mm-hmm. for you know passing mm-hmm. guard, side mount, that kind of stuff. And then only, um, only if you don't tap them. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> That's a mesh. And then you go essentially to like a pancreation scenario. Yep. yep. Right. No, no head stray, and then to MMA essentially. Yeah. Okay. Right on. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's legit, right there. They just had, that's, like that's I good. said, they just had the the tournament, and I didn't get to go. But all of the beginners, all all of the founders, were there. They're all older men, with yeah. beards and their bellies. Yeah. Do they do they escalate through all the bases and have like a all army? combatives tournament mm-hmm. that thing needs to be televised mm-hmm. i think jocko fuel needs to sponsor that yeah uh, that'd be i see them everyone you yeah, can yeah, catch you can every, catch you know, every once in a while where do you, you see, where do you see them on I, youtube or something yeah on youtube or something but they're like that. not on like a big channel it's not like the event show right. it's like a clip like someone recorded it or something like that yeah they were ready this year if we, if we had this four months ago if, mm-hmm. if you and i were sitting here four yeah. months ago you would have been you would have been a sponsor there. Oh, yeah they, well next year we'll be doing it yeah. And yeah, Tim Kennedy, who's a friend of mine, and 
how would you like to be like an army dude and you show up and you, Tim, you have to fight Tim Kennedy? <laughs> <laughs> the final He's like boss. A, an actual UFC dude. You're <laughs> oh, like, yeah. you're like, hold I, on a minute, hold I on th- a minute, man. I think we got our blue belt the same day. Oh, you and from, Tim from Hoist, yeah. Oh, right on. And, and he, Tim was at, at uh, Fort Bragg and with the sp- special force guys, and I, I would go in there every once in a while, and, and I'd say, "So if, if I'm holding you like this, then what?" <laughs> 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 yeah that works okay so. yeah that's awesome uh no uh anything else echo charles no that's it thank you great mm-hmm. to meet you yeah, great my to pleasure general any any closing thoughts well i i just appreciate um the chance to be here i'm i'm really humbled to to be sitting with you um i hope that that any message that i send out there to someone can help somebody um secondly um so there's a guy in Columbus, Ohio, named Zach. He said if, if I had let Zach sit there, he would let me have food and beer at his dad's restaurant for the rest of my life. <laughs> but uh, um, You should have brought him down. We would have definitely made that happen. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. We'll but, send him out to visit sometime. Does he train jujitsu? No. Okay, we'll send him out to so, visit, and he can train some jujitsu, and we'll, okay. we'll make it happen. Then he, That way you can eat for free. There you go. Got and to then take care of the general. To, to the rest of uh, the audience, there's a friend out there that needs to hear from you. So give a call, send a text, check on your battle buddy, your shipmate, your your, your fellow uh, team member. Check on somebody because you don't know if that's the one that's going to make a difference. Sometimes they just come in and they'll start working out again and all that. Other times they say, hey, I had a gun right here in front of me. So we can all make a difference in that stuff. And then um, if I could get you to sign something for, oh, yeah, absolutely. for those guys, no then, problem. then that'd be great. But uh Really honored to meet you uh, for the person and people that you guys are and the difference that you make for a lot of people. Well, uh, obviously, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for sharing your experiences and your lesson learned over your career of 35 years. And um, more important, thanks for your service in those 35 years in, in, in Somalia, in Iraq, countless other places around the world. Uh, static line jumping into God knows where to do God knows what uh, and thank you for what you are continuing to do today to preserve and memorialize our veterans and our history uh, it is much appreciated thank you sir all right sounds good thank you and with that general Mike Farader has left the building and we just walked out he was uh, definitely excited about the jujitsu mats. Yeah. He's definitely into jujitsu and jujitsu helping in all aspects of life. If you're not training jujitsu, go train jujitsu. Yeah. I think it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. I think it's pretty straightforward. It's a good way to add value. And that's not a popular, that's not something I like to say. Yeah. Cause you know why? Because in the military that, turns into a thing like oh I, that, we're really going to add value here right, so right, it's a, it's a corporate buzzword right yeah. and it's in, in the military is a corporate in the military is a buzzword mm. add value or value added either one right, of those right. two we could go either direction mm-hmm. but jujitsu is is going to add value Big time. to every part of your life now i would say unfortunately or fortunately it is secondary to what you claimed on one of our early podca- earliest podcasts, mm-hmm. that physical exercise is across the board gonna help out every aspect of your life. Yeah. I would prioritize that as number one. Mm-hmm. From physical activities, I would put jujitsu as number two. Mm-hmm. That's where I'm putting it. I agree. Yeah, so, and it was interesting that uh, recently, I forget what, I even forget what you said, but, it was along the lines. Oh, oh, you said something along the lines of uh, I was t- talking about lifting weights. Or we were talking about lifting weights. How that that'll help every aspect of your mm-hmm. life, right? Exercise, whatever. Mm-hmm. We'll just say lifting weights. And then you were like, "Well, even though you don't use it all the time, because it's not like every day you're going to be like, you know, um, power lifting <laughs> something, something along those lines." You said. And I remember thinking later on, I was like, "Wait a second, that's because that's not really the the benefits of the the weightlifting." Mm-hmm. Benefits of the weightlifting is, let's say you're like strong, like notably strong in all lifts and all things or whatever. It does translate to everyday stuff. Like if you're changing, you ever change one of those water bottles, those five gallon water bottles in the yep. cooler? Yep. Bro, it's way easier when you're strong. 
for sure. See what I'm saying? So there's tons of little things That's that you cool. can do day to day. I thought what you were going to say, <laughs> I thought you were going to say something that was meaningful. That, that is meaningful. Impact. That it's, is meaningful. It, it is it impactful. meant something to people. <laughs> okay. I thought you were going to say like, hey, when you lift every day, yep. it creates discipline in your life. It makes you overcome a challenge every day. It makes you mentally tired. So you can just go down there. I think it's true. you know, you're going to talk about five gallon water bottles. But it's true. That's It's all real. It's all part of it. That's what I'm saying. That's how beneficial it is because we can go deep like you or just go not so deep like me and everywhere <laughs> in between and boom, the lifting is going to, you know, yeah. it's going to add value. To so jujitsu, it's going to help you with your confidence. I mean, look, the physical things help. You're going to get more flexible. You're going to get good cardio. You're going to get good grip strength, strength in general. Mm-hmm. You're going to get the proprioception going to be improved. So there's a bunch of physical things that you're going to get. But man, the mental aspect, the release of aggression, the confidence built. Like you want a kid, you got a kid that lacks confidence, put him in jujitsu. Yeah. Put him in jujitsu. You you have a 22-year-old that lacks confidence, get him in a jujitsu. Yeah. You've got a 38-year-old that lacks confidence, get him in a jujitsu. Yeah. So it's gonna be beneficial in so many different and, and yes, you know what else that gives you? Gives you discipline, gives you the power to overcome. Gives you the power to fight through things. Gives you a sense of community. M- introduces you to new people. There's all kinds of beneficial things when it comes to jujitsu. Is it secondary to to sh- health and fitness, strength training, cardiovascular training, mobility training? It's secondary to those things. It's also complementary. Yeah. Like there's some people. Wait, do you lift and do jujitsu on the same day? Every once in a while, yeah. Is that? Is, but it's not. It's not planned. It's no. It if you be. if you set up your perfect schedule, would you do both things on the same day? One day, yeah. One but, day a week. Yeah, one day a week would have two days. Yes, a but two? only one day a week. Okay, they, they're essentially jujitsu and fitness. We'll talk about a workout or whatever would overlap on one day. Yeah. Okay, only one day. But they are complementary. You can do that. You can do one jujitsu one day, lift or work out the next day. Jujitsu the next day, work out the next day. You could do that, or you could do. Like I do, I do jujitsu and workout mm-hmm. the, the same day all the time. I do that. Well, let me put it this way: every time I train jujitsu, I lift it that yeah. day. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're we're batting a hundred percent. Yeah, man. And you know, some days I went for a run as well. Some days I went for a surf as well. In fact, most days I went for a run as well. So we got into controversy about this. Remember? Yes. On on uh, on more plates, more dates. Oh yeah, the steroids. Yeah, thing. that's one of the things that that. He said, which I, was my fault, because I said, yeah, well, I'll work out three or four times a day. To me, that was like, oh, lift, jujitsu, run, surf. Mm-hmm. This isn't me going in and doing you know, super squats. Right. And so he took that as, oh, if this guy's lifting four to three to four times a day, he's, he's doing steroids. Right. So my fault for not clarifying that. But I do do that. I do that as often as I can, as a matter of fact. Mm-hmm. Now, am I tired when I get done that? Dude, I was tired. We got home from training on Sunday. Mm-hmm. This Sunday, I was training. Mm-hmm. You you, you weren't there, actually. No, no. <laughs> you, Sunday, and you weren't there on Saturday, either. No, no, no. I never okay. I never go on Saturday. I don't think I've ever been there Saturday. Okay. So, I go on Saturday all the time. <laughs> I go on right off. Man, I was, I was tired yeah. on Saturday. Yeah. No, no. Sorry, on Sunday. That's the good training. Yeah. You get it out, man. You get you leave nothing on the mat. That's good yep. training. Yeah, feeling good about that. But it doesn't inhibit me. I might feel a little bit tight, but I'll still surf. I'll still go for whatever. You know, I'll still go for a run. I'll still do other stuff. I won't let it stop me. Yeah, is what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Hard training is not going to stop me from doing more training. I might not be the the best run I've ever done. Yeah, no. but I'm going to get it. Get some. Get some. If you know yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. So. Let's do jujitsu. That's Let's my jiu-jitsu. that's my recommendation. Yep. Work out, do jujitsu. I mean, look at the look at the general here. Sixty six years old, right? Yep. He's still training. Yeah, started at forty three. He at said forty three. So that's one of those men. Forty three. That was like a couple of years ago for me. Just starting and has a black belt, by the way. Yeah. So it's like, you yeah. know those things. Because come on, let's face it. That's a common question where it's like, hey, I'm forty. Should, yeah, I mean, is it too late for me to start? Because a lot of times you see these tournaments and these guys, you know, you see Gordon Ryan, you know, 
excelling in jujitsu and all these other guys where you look at me you're like bro i'm 40 right now <laughs> that's not me bro that's somebody else you know kind of thing but it's right it's not necessarily like that you know mm -hmm. even actually as a competitor you can still start at 40. oh yeah because sure. you can do the masters yeah the divisions yeah they got weight uh weight and, and age. age divisions yep. exactly and right. belt divisions and belt. across the board yep. so For let's go everybody. train some jujitsu train jujitsu guess what you're gonna need some fuel. You know what you're gonna need joint warfare. Yeah. <laughs> you're oh, yeah. gonna need joint warfare a hundred percent. Yeah, that's gonna help. The go get some joint warfare from jockofuel.com. Get some get some drinks. Get yourself some oh man. I went two. I went two on the discipline glow. Get yourself some discipline glow. Get yourself some mulk. Your post training mulk. Maybe that's why you can just keep getting after it. You got that mulk hitter. Yep. Get that protein going. Oh, yeah. That's all good for you. Uh you know we got hydration coming? Yep. I'm drinking one right now. It's right over here. Yeah. It's freaking awesome. Electrolyte beverage. Yeah. Mix. So good. Yeah. So good. Uh, you know, once again, natural. That's, a, that's what we're doing. We're, we're making it literally good for you. So we got yep. that coming online. Um, if you want this stuff, check out jockofuel.com or go to Wawa. Go to Vitamin Shop. Go to the military commissaries. And I just got word today from Joe Moss. You know Joe Moss? Yeah. No, I just Joe got Moss. word from Joe Moss where... Pending going into the military exchanges. So those of you in the military know what I'm talking about. We're in Hannaford. We're in Dash Stores. We're in Wake for ShopRite. H-E-B down in Tejas. By the way, if you're in Texas, your, your support is appreciated of the cause. Because at H-E-B, H-E-B is like, is these, this is our front lines. Yeah. So when you're out there in H-E-B, we appreciate your support on the front lines of the battle. We're in Meyer. We're in Harris Teeter. Just rolled into Harris Teeter. So you got a Harris Teeter by you. Check that out. Lifetime Fitness. Big gyms. Mm -hmm. You been to a Lifetime Fitness before? Yes. They're big. Yeah. Um, go. They got they got the drinks. They got the supplements. So go check that out. Jockofuel.com. Yeah, Make yourself better. Also, Origin USA. American made. Mm -hmm. They started with the geese. Mm -hmm. You know, we're doing jujitsu. jitsu okay, When you start jujitsu, if you haven't already, you're going to need a gi. You want to make sure it's American made. Probably the best quality gi, no matter who made it. Yep. Yep. You know, okay, you, you just mentioned American made. Mm. I'm starting to get more and more fired up because I see other companies out there. Yep. And what pisses me off is not that the other co companies are out there. That doesn't make me mad. It doesn't make me mad that they're out there. It makes me mad when they. They're, they, they are sending a virtuous message about themselves, about their company and how they're doing good. And they're actually lying. They're actually lying about this. They're not doing good. They're, 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 they have slave labor for one thing. Instantly, if you have slave labor, you're done. You're not doing anything good. You can't say anything virtuous. Yeah. Hey, if you wanna go and you wanna make your stuff in China and you wanna sell it here, you wanna keep your mouth shut and make money, okay. You're bad, but I have beef with you, but it's a contained beef. Contained beef. When you start t telling people about how virtuous you are, when you literally have slave labor and you're dumping chemicals into the, into the water and you're pouring chemicals into the air, that's what you're doing. And then you're talking to the American people as if you're virtuous. You're a liar. You're a scum. So don't be a part of that. Don't be a part of that. Get American made. Get American made. I don't care who it is. Look, look, Origins American made. Good. You can get that. You need that. Cool. But whatever you're getting, get yourself something that's American made. And especially, this is especially true with clothing. Especially true with clothing because those are sweatshops over there. So go to OriginUSA.com. We're taking care of the workers. We're taking care of the environment. And we're taking care of you. Because we're giving you the best damn jeans, the best gi, the best hoodie, the best t-shirt. We're giving you the best. And you don't have to have the karma of slavery and, and ecological disaster on your soul. It's freaking terrible. OriginUSA.com. Go get it. Get it. Yeah, those jeans are... Uh Extra legit black jeans available right now. Yep, Delta sixty eight. So the total, what are the what are the different models of the jeans? I know there's Delta sixty eight, the many washes, of yep. course. Yep. Then there's the and then there's the factory factory. Yep. Yeah, and that's more of the, like the thicker one, right? Yep. Not as They're stretchy, heavier. still a little bit stretchy. Oh, it's definitely stretchy. 
but more heavy. Yes, it's just thicker. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. if you're in if you're in Minnesota, yeah, you might want those factory jeans. Yeah, yeah. Winter time. If you're in Montana, winter time, you want those factory jeans. Even though I'll do, I'll be honest with you, I wear the Delta jeans. I wear Delta sixty eights year round. Yeah, yeah. But my legs don't. Do your legs ever get cold? No. I, I'm surprised your legs don't get a little chilly. Well, being I mean, that they're kind of skinny. <laughs> They have the capability <laughs> to get cold. Yes, thank you for asking. <laughs> Do your knees ever get the, cold? <laughs> generally speaking, we're pretty warm over here. Okay. Right? Generally speaking. Yeah. Thank you, though, yeah. Jocko, for asking. All right. But yeah, the Delta 68, oh yeah, all year. Mm-hmm. All year, all day. That That's my, my um, what do you call it, my my formal wear. Check. Yep, yeah, me too. Yeah. All right. No, we got what, the else? Black one. what else? Also, Jocko Store called Jocko Store. If you want to represent on the path, discipline equals freedom, because it does, by the way. Mm-hmm. The idea of good. Right, good. Something if you if you're faced with something bad, there's some good to come from it. You want to represent, bro? I'm telling you, we have shirts, hats, hoodies, whatever you need. JockoStore.com. Also, we have a it's called the Short Locker subscription scenario. You get a new shirt every month, different designs, creative. We'll say. Did you see Leif and Dave on the airplane together? Yep. They the did that. Uh, Dave wrote, "Planned or not." What do you think? I don't think it was planned. I don't think it was planned either. Because I can't really see them like calling yeah. each other up and be like, hey, I'm going to wear the freaking again shirt, you yeah. know? So, yeah, not planned. Uh, that's a good shirt, though. So, and yeah. I understand the, that kind of coincidence. And that's not even that much of coincidence because it's like, hey, if you're going to choose one, I could see why someone would choose that one. You got two yeah. people doing it. So, I get it, there man. You go. That was the January shirt for 2022. Again. Yep. Check. So, you, you understand the layer behind that, right? Oh, yeah. You know, new year, new me. No, nope. we're gonna do the same good stuff we've been doing again. Again, and actually, I got it from you. Cause well, yeah. You no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there you go. Jocklestore.com. Yeah. No, that's because sometimes I, I like wake up in the morning and I and I'm, I'm posting. Yeah. And guess what I'm doing? Everything that I did yesterday yeah. again. Again. I'm getting up early again. Yep. Going to work out again. Yep. That's what's happening again. I swear I got it. So there you go. Get yourself some of that. Uh, JockoStore.com. Go to uh, subscribe to this podcast. Subscribe to the Jocko Underground. Subscribe to the YouTube page. The Origin USA YouTube page. The Jocko Fuel YouTube page. The Echelon Front YouTube page. Go check those things out. We got some information on there for you. Check out FlipSideCanvas.com. Dakota Meyer. Badass. He, yeah, he's a badass. He's a Marine. He's just a guy that can make things happen. And he makes things for your wall, too. That you can hang on your wall. Flipsidecanvas.com. Check that out. We got a bunch of books. Written a bunch of books. You know what they are. If you don't have them, go get them. If you get and listen, the most critical of these. Look, you're you're 38 years old or you're 42 years old, and you want to get you want to get leadership strategy and tactics and become better yourself. Cool. But more important, actually, if you know a kid. Any kid in your neighborhood, the kid across the street, he seems to be freaking constantly like sitting out in the yard, not doing anything. Maybe he's digging the holes for no reason, you know, hucking rocks at things, no direction. Get that kid the way of the warrior kid books. Get them all five. Just literally get them and bring them over to that kid. Oh, it's a girl. No, it doesn't matter. Girl, boy, doesn't matter. So many girls read way of the warrior kid. Doesn't matter. No factor. And then you know what? Go to Home Depot and spend $12 on a piece of pipe and hang it from a tree in their yard so they can start doing pull-ups. And then just watch their entire life get better. Change the trajectory of their life. Way the warrior kid. Go get it. Also, we got Mikey and the Dragons. So that's what you need for kids. We talked about Hackworth today. I wrote the forward to the re-release of David Hackworth's book about face. Go pick that thing up. So it's an 800 page leadership lesson. It wasn't written for a leadership lesson. It was just written about a dude's life. But when you read it from a leadership perspective, you're going to see what's in there power. So check that one out. Also, we have Echelon Front, which is a leadership consultancy where we solve problems through leadership. We have echelonfront.com. That's where you get those leadership solutions. We have live events, we have online events. The online academy is called is at extremeownership.com. It's called the Academy, Extreme Ownership Academy. Go to extremeownership.com if you wanna learn the magic. The magic, we talk about jujitsu like it's magic, guess what else is magic? Knowing how to communicate with other people, 
knowing how to interact with other people, that's magic. So learn it. You don't know it, just like you don't know. If you don't, if you know jujitsu, cool. You know what a power it is. If you don't know what jujitsu is, and you've ever rolled with somebody, you realize that you get destroyed. I'm telling you right now, this is that is one aspect of life. It's being able to fight. There's another aspect of life. It's called being able to interact with other people, and it's magic if you know how to do it. And if you don't know what I'm talking about right now, if you don't understand what I'm saying right now. You should go to extremeownership.com right now and you should check out one of the free classes and see, go, oh, that makes sense. And then you go try it and it works. So check that out. And if you wanna help service members active and retired, you wanna help their families, Gold Star families, check out Mark Lee's mom, Mama Lee. She's got a charity organization. And if you wanna donate or you wanna get involved, go to americasmightywarriors.org. And also don't forget about Micah Fink who is, I guess, last report, is wearing a bear skin, and he is scaling a 14,000-foot mountain in the Rockies with no water. And he's helping other veterans do that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Heroesandhorses.org. Well, someday I'm going to go up there. When I'm older, I'm going to do, do that, whatever it is, 45-day program. Mm. Learn how to ride a horse, go out in the mountains, sit in cold water, eat, you know, bear or whatever they're eating. <laughs> yeah. You know how to ride a horse? No. No. A little no. bit? No, no, not at all. I've ridden a horse up at, we have a thing called the council yeah. at Echelon Front, and it's up at an off-site location where yeah. we have horses. So they put me on what's called a trail horse. Do you know what a trail horse is? Mm. A trail horse is just an old horse that just walks on. It, it doesn't. It knows exactly what to do. Yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, I'm trying to think if another situation like this. It's just a horse that's going to kind of be compliant, and yeah. it knows just to walk on the trail. Yeah. It's called a trail horse. Okay. It's not, and you're not really riding. You're right, not right. riding a horse. You're, you're on the horse, and it's it. walking, but you. <laughs> you're hitching a ride. You're kind of you're kind of just there. Okay. Yeah, right. and it's well tamed. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I, I so I don't know how to ride a horse, no. Check. I've been on a horse, but I don't know how to ride one very well Same. at all. Like, mm-hmm. I know if you pull the rein this way, you pull the rein that way. Yeah, yeah. I know how to stop it in an emergency. Yeah, yeah. But right now, I would just be a p- I'm pathetic. I'm with you. Now, Iris, you know, Iris Gardner? Yeah. Oh, yeah. She was, she's like, a, she was a horse wrangler. My mm-hmm. wife, too. Yeah. My wife uh, grew up on horses. Yeah. So she'll just jump on a horse and jump over stuff and run and gallop and do all this other yeah. stuff. <laughs> Sweet. You know, she's like a cowgirl. Yeah. In a sense. I understand. Well, her and Iris. Yeah. She's from England. So is that yeah. a cowgirl mm, from England? I don't can know you, what Can they you be c- a cowgirl from England? English, British cowgirl? I don't know. We have to ch- we have to check with the, check with my wife. Okay. I don't think so, though. I think cowboys are American. I think they might be American. No, but there's cowboys in, like, South America, too. There's, like, cowboys in Mexico. There's cowboys in, yeah. like, down in South America. Well, in Hawaii, a cowboy oh, is and there's, I think there's also in, like, in New Zealand and stuff. Oh, for real? Yeah. yeah. Maybe. So anybody that's basically a rancher. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. In Hawaii, they call them paniolos. Are they wearing cowboy hats? Yes. See, there you go. And, and cowboy boots. And cowboy boots. And they know how to lasso and do the, the whole gig. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, they have, like, shows and stuff, too. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It's impressive. It's pretty cool. Like I said, at some point when I have time... I'm going to go get with Micah Fink, and I'm going to learn all this stuff. Micah Fink did it. Yeah. He's like, grew, he grew up in what, New York, Long Island or something? There you go. Micah Fink, and then he's just like, no, I'm gonna, actually going to be a cowboy. In the wilderness. In the wilderness, and he straight up is. So yeah. good on you. There you go. Um, if you want to connect with us, first of all, with uh, General Ferreter, you can go to the ferretergroup.com. You can go to nationalvmm.org. And then there you can find the the social media for the National uh, Veterans Memorial Museum. You can also find him on Mike Ferreter on Instagram, Mike underscore Ferreter on Twitter, and Michael Ferreter on Facebook. And Echo and I are also on the social media. Reluctantly, kind of. A little bit. We're there. We're there. Look, we're not trying to waste your brain cells. We're trying to connect. Maybe you got a question. Maybe you want to. Maybe you want to see what's happening. Yeah. You can go on there. I'm just saying that there's an algorithm on there, and and I hate to tell you this, there's a decent chance the algorithm 
is stronger than you are. There's a decent chance that the algorithm is stronger than you are. Don't let it be. It's not, it's not because it's more physically powerful. It's because you're allowing it to be stronger than you. And I'm just saying don't. Don't allow the ag- algorithm to be stronger than your willpower. It's a bad move. And it will make the rest of your life worse. It will make the rest of your life worse. So don't let that happen. And thanks again to General Mike Farrader. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for the lessons that you passed on to us today. Thank you for spreading the word of jujitsu and starting combatives in, in the army. It's, it's awesome. One man, a lot of impact. And also thanks to the rest of our warriors out there in the military who are making sacrifices right now so that we can remain free. Also, thanks to our police, law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, Border Patrol, Secret Service, and all first responders. Thank you for what you do every day and the sacrifices that you make every day so that we can be safe here and to everyone else out there. Let's think about well, let's think about those attributes that a warrior is supposed to have from the Army Combatives Manual. Here's something to think about personal courage, self-confidence, self-discipline. What's interesting about those attributes is they're not inherited. They're not passed down in your genes. You don't get personal courage from your mom and dad. You don't get self-confidence from your genetic gene pool. And you damn sure don't get self-discipline in your bloodstream. These are choices that you make. You choose to be courageous. You choose to have confidence. And most of important, you choose. You make the choice to be disciplined, to have self-discipline. So make the right choice by getting up every day and getting after it. And I think that's all we've got for tonight. So until next time, this is Echo and Jocko.